and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, as always, I have my two good bro two good brothers here. On one end, we have the we have the man who is campaigning to cap to captain his own airship, and probably would make the world's worst Captain Harlock um, cosplay. Good brother Ash, and we uh -huh. have the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the and the man who is and the man who is the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. We are back. We are back once again. This time around, we're dealing. We're dealing with everyone's fa everyone's favorite ori original class. Do not steal, the warlock. I oh um, she donut steal. <laughs> yes, I um. To be, I actually to be fair, I I don't have anything against the warlock. I just I just like giving the tiefling warlock um characters a fa characters a fair amount of shit because because they um <laughs> a lot of them a lot of them act like they, like they're doing something unique by going with tiefling warlock and you have any idea how many times I saw how many times I would see that particular archetype um when I was doing one shots I more often saw tiefling bards that was a that was a close second but more often than not it was t it was it was tiefling warlocks and the majority of I, I do want to. I do want to note that in my sample size, limited as it was, the majority of the people playing Tiefling were women. And the reason why Lords of Brackus makes Tiefling uh, Catholic stand-ins. <laughs> <laughs> the prerequisite for being a Tiefling player character is at some point you were baptized. Um, works wonders. Nah. Now, um, with cer now, um, you you may have now the other day I had um I had commented about a a cer a certain a certain um comic that had been making the rounds over the past couple weeks. Some of you may, some of you may have seen it with the um with the with the um human fighter who who's, who gets picked on by the rest of the party and then and then quits. Oh. I have yes, that. yes, I did see that. Hey, because she barges into a, she barges into a, my goodness, yeah, it was this one barges into a cabin filled with uh, tiefling characters. Oh, jeez, gets yeah. <laughs> mercilessly bullied. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, about them being now the whole the whole thing is is basically is basically trying to take trying to take the take the piss out of. Out of the whole thing, and I I did a I did a micro th micro thread where because I had noticed some people were using it for adi for addition flexing, i.e. dick measuring contest, but I had I had saw it as I saw it as a consequence of what of what happens when you when you don't when you don't set the when you don't set the boundaries about what kind of fantasy you're running. You just say we're running a fantasy campaign. Um. Although truth be told, I will admit, um, fourth edition tieflings were at least had at, at least had an interesting backdrop. They weren't doing the whole half demon thing. It was more of your ancestors made deals with the devil, and your, and because of that, you because of that, you and everybody else after that um, is kind of screwed. Oh. And. The the appro the the point that I was trying to get across is that um is that when you have when you have too wide of having too wide of a net means that pe means that people are going to are going to are going to stick with their with their idea of their idea of comfortable i.e. they're going to have a very protagonist mindset um some of that is some of that isn't isn't very helped by ha by um a lot of trends over the over the last over the last 30 or 40 years in um fan in popular fantasy fiction to to be to be quite to be quite fair um you know where where there's a lot that's focused a lot of fantasy fiction that's focused on a a singular pair or a pair of characters instead of ensembles 
which a um a tabletop campaign for all intents and purposes is going to be on an ensemble an ensemble story um but the whole the whole I the whole idea with warlock which is that is that um they are that they're supposed to be natural that they're supposed to there's that they're supposed to be um casters who who get who get their magic through contracts from some kind of entity and um Asham noticing a bit of echo from you thank you um I've it could it could be they could be likened to an arcane cleric um and the whole pact set up that the whole pa pact or patron set up over the years has is kind of ironic given that the given that the word warlock um has its has its roots in a word that would translate to oathbreaker um now in fir now um in first edition AD&D um warlock was just a title for someone who was an eighth level magic user so not a whole not a whole lot to talk about there there was um there was a witch npc class that was brought up in an issue in an article in dragon um and and just said if you wanted a warlock just ha just use the witch npc class and just gender swap it um you did have you did have war you did have warlock as a class kit in um second edition a d and d this one came from the complete wizard's handbook because casters don't have didn't have enough books around that time um this t in this case it was a wizard kit called the witch and had me had mentioned that if you wanted to do a male wi that a male witch would just be a warlock so if you want to yeah. do that just just um sw just swap um But the, but un, unlike, but unlike um unlike a wizard, you needed to have decent wisdom and constitution as as well. Um. But it didn't. But it wasn't all that supported because well, it wasn't it wasn't official. Um, we didn't we didn't see a proper warlock class until complete arcane in three point five. Um. It looks it looked overpowered on paper, but was kind of meh. It's tier four. It can do some things really well, but it can't. But it can't. It can't stack. It can't stack up to others. Um. The bit, the um, and to be to be quite honest, when a lot of people looked at um, War, when a lot of people looked at Warlock, a big question that they had was. Why should I pick why should I pick Warlock when I can get when I can get a lot of that stuff and better by picking the by picking the better version of Sorcerer? Um The The big claim the big claim to fame when it came to the when it came to the third edition um Warlock, um aside from aside from the fact that it that um it was where we first got the whole invocation thing, is um Eldric Blast. Um and it it was ba it was basic it was basically their um their si their signature spell in in a, in a sense um it was but the big pr the big problem with it is it is um it started out as a as a first as a um as the equivalent of a first level spell that you that you could modify that would do one d six um damage but compa but um it didn't it didn't but it couldn't really up it couldn't really upgrade itself all that well compared compared to blasting spells i mean even at because it was at um so that one d one d six at first level two d six at th and then would get would get another d six um every every other level but by the time you reach the teens that am that amount is that amount isn't really going to isn't really going to cut it as much i mean 
there is there is the there is the ad, there is the advant there is the advantage that um there unless I'm, unless I'm misreading it there isn't a there isn't a um spells per day but one of the dumb moves that they did at the time was um meta magic feats cannot improve eldritch blast um ability focus can increase the dc to to saving throws um associated with it but <laughs> Who the hell? But all all that that does is just increases the DC by two. Who the hell is gonna take that? Yeah, it sounds like warlocks were pretty uh pretty neutered back in the day. I'd say I'd say it was more, I'd say it was, although surprisingly, um, they did get they for a non-core class they did get a decent amount of support, um. There was a slightly different version in the Dragonfire Adept, which, in my opinion, is a lot better because there's a lot more you can do since it's building up... Instead of you... It replaces the Eldritch Blast idea with giving you a bunch of different breath weapons, mm -hmm. which is better. Um, it, um, it was put into Neverwinter Nights 2, but there's no reason to use it. Um, Warlocks got relegated to a dip class, essentially. Um, well, I mean, everything got relegated to a dip class in third. Yeah. Pathfinder didn't do a straight warlock conversion, but there were some close equivalents. One of them being the kineticist, which mechanically is similar to war <laughs> the which is kind of funny because the the lore explanation for kineticist is that it's especially since it came from occult adventures is that it's supposed to be some kind of some kind of um, psychic, but for all intents and purposes, it's a fucking bender. <laughs> um, uh, gotta love it. However, kineticist is considered one of the hard, one of the hardest classes to effectively um, build, and anybody who wanted to do a warlock equivalent for Pathfinder would just take the witch instead. Oh, so now we're reverting back to AD and D one and two. Mm -hmm. Well, they could they couldn't because of the fact that it's not in, it's not OGL. They couldn't take the warlock from three point five. Mm -hmm. um, Ultimate intrigue tried tried to try to make another crack at it by having a um by having the warlock be an archetype of the vigilante. And but even even th even that one is. Isn't quite going to work because then you're de then you're um, dealing with dealing with double dip dealing with some forms of um, double dipping, mm -hmm. um, and of course of course by mid level you're completely out you're completely outclassed unless you use the unless you use certain third party materials. I mean you've got decent casting and and you have martial weapons, but the problem is um, a lot of the more supported classes are going are going to be out are going to be outdoing you. Um, yeah. And fourth edition is what once again once again we seem to be seeing this pattern. This was where warlocks really started to establish an identity. Now in this case it was the other PA, it, the other player's handbook mage class as arcane strikers. Mm -hmm. And flavor wise there was there were these there was, they were meant to be the they were meant to be um these people you wouldn't want to piss off lest they tr lest they put curses on you um cuz they much like the ranger in 4th edition they were they were um and a lot of the strikers they benefited from the marking effect i.e. um mark an enemy and you're and you're going to be getting benefits when you're when you focus all your attention on that marked enemy um this is also where we st where um, we started to see the earlier version of what would become patrons in fifth edition, just as um, pacts. Um, and of um, of course, if somebody wanted to get really crazy at at um, once you once you got into the teens, you could take a feat called twofold pact, where you could get a second patron, <laughs> getting access to its cantrips and pact boons. So you so you have so you have versatility, um. There 
And they they also had a bit of a stealth they also had a bit of a stealthiness to them because Shadow Walk granted them concealment unt until the end until the end of their next turn or any turn in which they moved at least three squares. Um Now, f now, fifth edition, tr fifth edition has tried to have this, bl have have this kit bash of all three, inclu including the third edition invocations, the fourth edition packs, and fifth edition spellcasting. Um, they, I think, the reason why the warlock ended up being so popular is once is um, they look not that impressive on paper, but when you but when you actually get down to the cr to the crunchy bits. They can. They are. They are significantly more powerful than they first appear. They're really easy to min max as well, especially yeah. if you want to make something that's tanky, can snipe and wade in as if they're some sort of heavy plate paladin. Mm -hmm. You you could do that with a fiend pact and a few of the of the invocations that extend your eldritch blast real easy. Yeah, um, I do remember. I do remember the last time I played when I played a hexblade who. Um, Really, who abu who abused concealment a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he was he would co he would constantly be throwing eldritch bl Eldric blasts while um concealed. Um. Yeah, and with a uh, with spell sniper and uh, eldritch uh, spear, mm -hmm. you could basically shoot from concealment and shoot into any concealment that was three quarters or lower. Yeah. Um, now, in, invocations invocations obviously returned, but they were they were scaled back and and were more about providing um, abilities from access to spells that aren't on aren't on the list as as a, as AEDs or or powers to the for the pact form and of course boosting Eldric Blast. Um, and the thing. The thing that's the thing that's the th I'd say the I'd say the biggest thing that r that ends up helping the warlock compared to other classes is have is having your spells scale automatically instead instead of having to worry about different level spell slots you have a unified list of spell slots and a and a sl and a slot level for the, for all those spells. It does mean that you're not going to get the high, the higher t the higher tiers, and even even at capstone, you're going to have four sp you're going to have four um, spell slots, but they're all but all of them are going to be fifth level. Um. And when it comes when it comes to when it comes to inv when it comes to um invocations, which let me let me. You get a ton of them throughout our uh, base warlock. Mm -hmm. um, you get you st you start off with two, and by and by capstone you're gonna have you're gonna have eight. Um, yeah, and that's that's a ton. There are there are a few that are must grabs, like mm -hmm. one or two, but it's not like how in a third. You had to grab this feat to get the next feat to do all that. There are just about one or two that are like, yeah, you want this to be a, even a remotely effective warlock, and then the rest is all, how do you want to your warlock to be useful otherwise? Yeah. Um. Now, when <clears throat> now when it comes to now. That brings that obviously brings us to the um, level to the level up version of the, of the warlock, which is still is still going with is still going with the general mo the general motif um, of you. I remember I remember some I remember so, I remember someone describing it as a wizard get a wizard gets his power because he studied his ass off. A sorcerer gets his power just because he's that just because he's just because he's a he's naturally that good. A war, a warlock get a warlock gets his powers because he sucked off the professor. That's one way of putting it, but I usually see the see the pacts as more predatory than that. Yeah, 
but this this was this has always resulted in a bit of an awkward thing because um well if you'll allow me to go if you'll allow me to go full of weeb for a bit um one obviously as an, as any man of culture should i love i love both versions of full metal alchemist there is one per there is one particular um issue that issue that i have however um a big th a big thing that's implied when it comes to being a being a state alchemist is you're answerable to the to the Amastris military. But and it's this what this wasn't brought up as much as much in Brotherhood, but it was brought up significantly in the in the first in the um, first version. That you may that that you may be you may be called upon to to um perf to perform some to perform some sort of orders or or some or do something that you that would normally go against your code. But that's why all of the state alchemists are called dogs of the state. Mm -hmm. And while we while we see while we see this while we see this kind of thing when it came to when it came to the um. Ishbal and Civil War. When it comes to when it comes to the adventures of the Elric brothers, we never really get, even though even though it's even though it's repeatedly lampshaded throughout the series, um, that position never that position never happens in that sense. Yeah, but there's there's plot reason for that. There is there is plot there is plot reason. But it's it's one of it's one of those things that always that always um always not always nod in the back of my mind. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason I bring this kind of thing up is because is because with with warlocks in both fourth and fifth edition, that kind that kind of un that kind of uncomfortableness with the fact that you're making a deal with some kind of devil, uh, even if it's not a fiend, it's never is um is not really is not really brought up all that much. I know when I played Warlocks in Fifth, I baked it into their background. Yeah, there's a, there's an implication that you bake it into the background, but um, but it's but it doesn't it's not willing to go all the way with it. Um, Thirteenth Age has at least a better chance at going all the way with it simply because of the icon system. Mm -hmm. Where and the and the fact that the powers that you have access to as a Thirteenth Age style warlock. Are going to be tied to icon relationships. Yep. In one form or another, not not di not directly saying that if you have a negative relationship with, say, the emperor, that you that you're not going to be able to use any of the, any of those abilities, but it's one of those things that can be called. It's one of those things that can be called upon as a seed. The yes, yeah, an, an adversarial relationship with your patron. Mm-hmm. Which is another thing that's that's brought up about what about whether or not, um, the what what are the consequences of di of disobedience, and the and the bigger elephant in the room. Why has your paladin not? Why has the paladin in the party not tried to kill you? If you don't do anything to violate their code, even if they don't like what you are, they still won't try to kill you. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of those things that get that gets brought that gets brought up, especially especially with some of the more Gung ho kind of paladins who are all who are all about all about cleave and smite evil. Okay, so probably just my play group because you know most of our evidence is anecdotal here. Mm -hmm. But there's a group where I was playing one of my warlocks, and he uh, he looked human, sounded human, everything was very human about him. But the first time the paladin saw him get the temporary HP armor from being uh, under the patron of the fiend, the uh, paladin immediately attacked in the middle of battle. <laughs> the DM looked at this paladin like he was an idiot. Because he wasn't a paladin that would have gone after a fiend. Not for existing. But it was pretty funny. Mm-hmm. To see the paladin immediately turn against me just because he saw me get fiery armor. Even um, I, again, this com this comes back to that whole that whole thing of 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 needing to ne needing to narrow needing to 
narrow down exa exactly what exactly what your what your setting is doing. And I know I know I keep talking about that whole about this whole half in half out set setting thing, but if the shoe fits. <laughs> mm -hmm. And once again, I want I want to make clear I'm not bringing this kind of thing up to addition flex. This is a problem I've this is a problem I've had for years. At the very least, get off the pot. Um, the very, I I do think another I do think another major pro, major issue is um, and even even fourth edition kind of stumbled with this, is not is not giving not giving out not um going into more detail when it comes to, the potential um patrons. There was an article in Dra in Dragon I remember, that did give a short list of example patrons from e from each type. But I think giving yeah. a, I think giving a bit more giving a bit more detail might might have um, helped. Well, and then looking at the at some of the example patrons in fifth, especially with the expanded fifth stuff, um, there are some that you wouldn't want to explain more of because then that's breaking the uh, mythos they come from. Like a great old one. That's mm -hmm. Lovecraftian mythos. You don't explain the great old ones. They just are. Your mind cannot uh, grasp the shape of Gygus's attack. When it comes when it comes to that kind of thing, I um, I like th I prefer the I prefer the term that they had in fourth edition. They where they were referred to as Star Pact. So at least with Star Pact, it it does it le does it lean into the Lovecraft. A little, but not, but not explicitly so. So it's a case of if you want to go down that route, you can, or if you want to say that it's, um, that it's that it's purely neutral beings that it, that exist be, that exist beyond the stars, you can take that route too. Oh, and well, welcome back, Ash. Oh, I've been here for a little bit. I was just muted to my, st my stalling tactic feedback. actually paid off. I should have been a senator. I seem to be good at filibustering. No. No, because you're not the Senate. <laughs> well, there, there's also there's also the fact that that um, the that the first the first thing that I tr the first thing that I try and enact is is bringing back cane fights. Might pass in current day. You never know. <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying it would it would make watching C-SPAN more interesting. I mean um there there was that there was that whole um there was that whole thing a few years ago where where somebody was a, where somebody was able to get a um able to put in trial by con combat to, in in their in their um in their legalities. <laughs> <laughs> actually got away with it. Hey, if someone doesn't pay attention to the clauses in the contract. <laughs> Gotta read that fine print, folks. That's why we care that's why we carry a microscope. But getting getting to getting to the heart getting to the heart of the matter. Um the level up warlock still has a still has a D eight. Um the main the main features I don't I don't think have changed all that much. Nope, doesn't look does not look like it. Um, and we have we have the whole thing with the patron, which um, it is about is about the same. Well, we'll get to that when we get to the subclass hour. Then we have um, packed magic, which which is again about the same. It looks like, although there 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 does seem to be one bit of, bit of a bit of a change, and that is the introduction of spell points. So it shows how many spell points you have to cast one of your warlock spells of first level or higher. You must expend a number of spell points dependent on the spell's level. You can also cast a spell you know at a higher spell level by spending the appropriate number of spell points. The maximum spell level you can cast is shown on the spell level column of the warlock table. You regained all expended spell points when you finish a short or long rest. Mm. Um, so well, I mean, 
all expended spell points at even a short rest, which is only an hour. That's that's reasonable. But uh, if it were only long rests, I'd have a bigger problem. So it, it um it looks like in it looks like instead of doing the instead of doing these spell slots, they just de they decided to have the warlock do a point system. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not enti I'm not entirely sure why. I mean, I'm not I'm not a I'm not opposed to the idea of of doing of doing proper spell points, not that not this whole um not this whole ma mash all the spell levels together and call it a and call it a point system that f that 5e and 3 and 3e attempted. Is that what that, and then, was, that wasn't a spell point system. That was just a bandage. Yeah. And then what's uh what's really interesting is that your spells known is just a number. It doesn't you can know spells of specific levels at specific times while you're leveling up mm -hmm. and then you can just choose as many spells as you want to known in like for example if you were to get to seventh level and you have access to fourth level spells uh you've probably picked a few spells of first second and third level just because you need them as you're leveling mm -hmm. but you could for example swap out other spells lower level spells with fourth level spells if you wanted to yeah, if you wanted to. And truth, truth be told, one of the one of the appeals with the spell system for the warlock is to, is taking the is taking the Vancian model and um and sim and simplifying it by get by getting rid of the whole multiple uh, multiple slots for for spell levels of the same spell. Um, the whole uh, the whole auto upgrade, which is which is why uh, which is why I'm kind of. I'm not I'm not putting it in red, but I'm kind of perplexed as to why they went with this spell point system instead and instead of just instead of just leaving the um the set the setup as it was. I'm also not seeing or is that just in the table? Hold on. So the thing is, in 5th edition, spell slots don't really work meaningfully differently from spell points. There's a very slim margin of of differentiation for how things... Like, 5th edition's optional... I don't know if you've ever checked out 5th edition's optional rule for using spell points. It's It works almost functionally identically, because given that 5th edition doesn't really engage in true fancy and casting... Uh, they're just like spell slots and spell points are basically are functionally interchangeable. Which is, again, I'm not again I'm so, not writing off this. I'm not writing off the. No, no, uh, hold on. I'm I'm quite finished yet. When it comes to the when they do this when they do spell points with the warlock specifically though, with that in mind, that spell slots and spell points are functionally interchangeable. I'm wondering if they're going to take advantage. This will be my one concession to these designers today because I am not a fan of this document and I'm going to be yelling at them later. But I am wondering if they are future proofing a little bit and setting things up to where the various otherworldly patrons are going to give you bonus spell points or reduce spell point costs for specific varieties of spells. Or specific lists of spells to where your patron specific, like if I get from the Archfey the, I don't know, Entangling Strike or Ensnaring Strike, it costs only one spell point instead of two spell points for me. I could see that as some future proofing, but since we don't have any, any way to, other than pure speculation to extrapolate that... Um, we have one. I, we have that one slight bit that that one slight inclination towards speculation, which is the fact that they did spell points as opposed to spell yeah. slots. 
They, yeah, and that, the fact that they engage in that right. difference, I have no doubt that they that they know spell slots and spell whatever are interchangeable because they basically use the same the same list, mm -hmm. the same the same rate of conversion as base fifth edition. So if they're going to use these spell points, my sincerest hope. And it, normally it would be a certainty, but with this document, it's only a hope that they would engage in that they would engage in some sort of purpose for including that mechanic. Yeah, I can see that. And it, it's at this time that I, I should probably let viewers know. Um, I, I've kind of been the guy who never reads the document before we start, so I'm the guy who gets to give the fresh reactions. Mm -hmm. And be as pissed off as possible. I guess my role is just to be a reactionary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck off. Ha! <laughs> um, obviously, I'm skipping spells known at first level and higher spell casting ability and focus because we know how we know how that kind of thing works. There's no. You're skipping it. You don't need to give the explanation, Mildred. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Then we get to Eldritch Eldritch Blast, which um. They've it, changed into like three different things you can pick from for how your blast works. Yeah, I um I think I'm trying Eldritch to Ray, Eldritch Ray is the traditional core Eldritch, Eldritch blast. blast. Yeah. You get the 120 feet deadly beam that uh ranged its spell attack mm -hmm. 10d uh, 1d10 uh force damage. Yeah. Eldritch Scythe would be kind of I mean, it sounds interesting, but it's melee range. And it's only 1d8 force damage. And yes, sure, it does cleave, but only at half damage. Uh, that's actually pretty important for certain combinations that are theoretically possible in 5th edition. or Well, which are possible in 5th edition, but might theoretically be possible in 5th edition as well. Or, sorry, in the level up playtest as well. Uh, we might, I might bring this up after, after we get through the next one of my commentary on it. And I have no idea. So, Eldritch Spasm is weird. Because Eldritch Blast used to have, I don't know if, I haven't looked ahead to see if that invocation is still here. The one where you could add your Charisma mod to damage. Um, which is what deadly Eldritch Blast or something. I feel like agonizing. I, feel like, I believe it's still. I it. feel like Eldritch yeah. Blast. Eldritch Blast originally was just a cantrip. Um, yes. Eldritch Blast here feels feels like feels like them integrating Eldritch Blast with the with um packed bo with the packed boon that you would normally get at third level. Although, actually, I take that back because you still get packed boon at third level. So, <laughs> so this... go, go figure. Eld Eldritch Blast is still like a cantrip, apparently. Mm -hmm. it, 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 um, but now it's a class feature instead of a cantrip. Um, I'm guessing. I'm guessing that's so that you that so people could free that slot up for other cantrips. Likely. Um, but Eldritch Spasm is half the range of Eldritch Ray, but instead of you making a ranged spell attack, target has to make a a saving throw. Um, and I don't... But it's a wisdom Definitely saving throw. the weaker of the three options. It, the, yeah, it is on the, the weak, face of it. On the face of it, especially at early levels, that DC is going to be so easy to overcome. Yeah, it, um, you're basically going to be flipping a coin is, yeah. as to whether or not it's going to work. Eldritch, Whereas, Eldritch Scythe, I could... I could for those who for those who for those who want to dip into a bit into a bit of melee, I can see that one being more more um it, more interesting because because it's one it's one d eight with cleave. Yeah, I could. I That's could the see. thing is sometimes as a warlock you jump into the like you have to jump into the fray because your your party doesn't have enough melee people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or you straight up you build your warlock for melee the. Watsi has actually done a pretty decent job of overcoming the the sort of supremacy of Eldritch Blast over the years, uh, just by making just by making melee not necessarily superior to Eldritch Blast, but more attractive to it. Mm -hmm. Well, 
And I could see, like, Eldritch Scythe has a perfect pairing with Pact of the Blade, so, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes... Well, when it comes to... At, next is... Invoc next is... Invoc let's, let's go back for a sec. Let's go back for a sec. Cause we gotta... We gotta look at something. So what are these guys trying to do by splitting up Eldritch Blast into these three things? And not no longer as its own cantrip, but as as these three because this is gonna be it's, it's instrumental roles. in discussing it's the rest of this document. It's different it's different roles in within the party. Mm -hmm. Um okay. with it, specifically within combat. Eldritch Ray is your is your standard uh sniping blaster caster. Yeah. Whereas Scythe is going to be more geared towards being that melee caster, and Spasm seems almost like it's a support role. I'd I'd say that, especially especially since it's um it's it's um, it feels like you would, yeah, it feels right. like you would you would take one of these different forms based on how you expect your character to act in battle within the the broad tripartite role system that everyone is familiar with in in RPGs of damage tank and support the eldritch scythe a, a lot of melee classes are used to block things from getting closer to your casters and rangers because if they get into the casters and rangers, the casters and rangers die. Mm. And by rangers, I don't mean the ranger class. I mean ranged attack. Ranged attackers, yeah, your yeah. archers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> whereas uh, a, a, a support role is kind of a, a midfielder. They're kind of going to be... Uh, maybe they can get in a little closer at times. Maybe they can get in a little further away. Uh, they they can kind of swap between the two, and they can they can free up things to take mm -hmm. more versatility in their magic. Right. Um, Eldritch Chasm doesn't require you to be. It doesn't fail to work or impose any penalty on you if you're within melee of the person, despite yeah. it being a ranged effect. That's that's sort of the one advantage, a more subtle advantage that it has, and you could see the. If they included any invocations, and I haven't gone through the entire list of invocations as of yet, um, having some sort of support base effects where maybe Eldritch Spasm, the nature of Eldritch Spasm forces them to take some sort of penalty, or maybe it deals half damage even if they succeed, things of that variety. Yeah, My curiosity sense. on Eldritch Blast is, so we have this thing where you take a different kind of Eldritch Blast, and it says a different thing about your character's choices as time goes on. Hmm. It says a different thing about your character's role in the party, even though we're mostly focused, on, focused in on combat right now, which even level up, most of it sort of revolves around combat, but you are, able, you are able to, like, dip into other social abilities and enjoy exploration and other modes of play. I'm curious as to why they... Just stuck with Eldritch Blast. We'll probably why not? Go ahead. We'll probably get, we'll probably get we'll probably get some um some some approach to some approach to that as we as we go further down. We don't. Spoiler. <laughs> Spoiler. But, I if I had if I had to make the guess why they kept Eldritch Blast and even turned it into a class feature. It's the same thing we've seen in a few of the other documents where they're working with the the core of what they're given. Mm -hmm. This is meant to be a an improvement and expansion upon 5e, thus level up 5e. Eldritch Blast is literally the most iconic spell a warlock will have. There is no warlock in normal 5e that will not take Eldritch Blast. It's that useful. I'm completely agreed. I'm completely agreed. And that's sort of my issue with this, is the idea that you're a you're an Archfey Warlock, mm -hmm. and you fire off Eldritch Blast, and you're a Pact of the Fiend, and you fire off Eldritch Blast, and you're a Pact of the Genie, and you fire off Eldritch Blast, and the Pact of the Celestial, and you fire off Eldritch Blast, and of course, if Great Old One, you fire off Eldritch Blast. And Great Old One is probably the one that makes that has the most mechanical or sorry, thematic synergy with 
remember having a conversation with Aaron the Pandantic and him mentioning, like, wouldn't it be cool if each one of these sort of had their own thematic cantrip, which was tied in some capacity to the actual to the actual patron? Well, I don't Fifth remember. edition doesn't do that, and we know why fifth edition doesn't do that. But in the level up play test, let me let me check something in core real quick. I I, I want to just check. Is there is there something specifically you're looking for? I might be familiar with it. Just the actual Eldritch Blast spell entry. So, uh, so the actual spell entry description is. A beam of crackling energy streaks towards a creature within range. Mm -hmm. that, that's really the only description you get. I'm seeing here in level up, at first level, you learn to use your patron's power as a weapon, blasting enemies with an eldritch force that defies even the laws of magic. That right there gives you a, a narrative hook to flavor your eldritch blast however you want. Oh, I've got uh, Pact of the Fiend. So this right. is a this is a it's going to look like scorching ray, but it's still force damage. <laughs> I mean that's that that's the limitation there. Everything with eldritch blast is force damage, but you pack to the fiend. You you know you've got bail as your as your uh, as your patron. So you you your eldritch blast when you shoot it, whether it's eldritch ray, eldritch scythe, or eldritch spasm, is this is this crackling. Uh, black and red sinister energy that just seems to suck the light out of the area around you just for a split second. You could, you could flavor it however you want at that point because you are using your patron's power. Uh, as for uh, Pact of the Celestial, all of a sudden, your Eldritch Blast becomes a blinding ray of light. Still we, could all, we could all think of flavorful like aesthetic descriptions for it. Mm. Right, those are easy to come up with, but notice you're now using a defensive, a rather typical defense of 5th edition, base 5th edition. Where it's like, well, we don't necessarily need the mechanical differentiation because we can flavor it however we want. Yeah, I feel like I, we've come I haven't, to heard, I haven't heard that before. Even before, right. fifth, even before 5th edition, I heard that line. I'm sure. And it's it's uh, occasionally I hear from OSR guys, which is particularly funny. Well, um, but in, in like this, like, we've come to expect... What's her primary praise of this? Of these? What has been her Pers primary praise? Personality. Of these yes, I know. Personality. I'm like playing devil's in the narrative with the mechanics. And so when they just dump this on top of us, and it it would be okay if like we saw references later to the nature of specific pa patrons having very flavorful tie-ins with Eldritch Scythe, Eldritch Spasm, Eldritch Ray. I have a perfect. You don't see that in this document, and you won't see this then this document. I have a perfect contrast. Mm -hmm. Remember in the Druid document when you could change the way things looked and did stuff and and had effects based on the seasons, and based on natural effects. Vaguely, I don't, I don't, I don't remember the Druid too well. I sort of coasted through that one. Pretty sure that was the Druid, wasn't that the Druid monk? Yeah, I think you're right. I just didn't yeah. get much of it. Where, where it affected it affected the or or was it was one of the class abilities that basically turned you into a fey, or at least a partial fey. You'd get the pay, the fey template as part of your your character. And that was, no, I I take it back. That was sorcerer. That it was sorcerer. Yes, excuse that was me, sorcerer. And as you as you leveled up in sorcerer, you'd be get you'd be getting more and more aspects um, tied to your sorcerer's origin. You'd start, yeah, you start. Yeah, get you might get horns. You might get you might get um, mm. a D, you might get um, sunburn <laughs> if you were a fiend. If you were a fiend, you might you might get the you might get some more fey attributes if you ha if you had fey. Mm. And I'm guessing and, I'm guessing what you're what you're thinking of is you'd you'd like to see something like that in um, warlock. Well, there was also the the additional that uh, some of the spells you got. Access to, uh, I, I specifically remember this in the Fae because I remember seeing, uh, you know, different nature types got like acid and and or a different one got decay and I remember seeing that in the, 
and that's that's what I'm equ equating this to. Mm -hmm. That you'd get actual in-game, both mechanically and narratively, effects as the sorcerer with the sorcerer's origin compared to what we're seeing here with Eldritch Blast. And I think that's the perfect contrast here. Also, uh, si side note, Ash, remember that I play Devil's Advocate a lot. No, no, I do. I do remember that. I do remember that. It's, 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 I don't mind it in the slightest. It, it matters with this. Mm -hmm. I, I've, uh, I, if, if someone's got to play one side of the argument, even if they don't believe in it. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's just when we're looking at Eldritch Blast, and if this was the this was the the canary in the coal mine for me, as I was reading through, I'm like, they just went with this. They just went with, like, a no, no reference to... Because here's the thing. The patron... My anticipation of a warlock is that the patron makes the class. The patron makes the character. Insofar as all considerations about who this character is and what it is. It's so deeply tied in with the narrative. Far beyond most other, most other classes. And when I didn't see what I thought would be a really easy method of tying in, sort of, I, I know that they've been avoiding subclasses for the most part when it comes to these uh, when it comes to these documents. I think that's a mistake for the warlock because, again, the patron makes the character. Yeah. Uh, oh. It was a very glaring omission. Yeah, this was this was the manifestation of your conduit was was what I was talking about, mm -hmm. and and how your sorceress origin would add to that. I'm I'm yeah. pretty sure the other thing with the Fey is still is still what I was thinking of with Druid. But but before we in go, the before we go, yeah, I think it was in there. Yeah, but before we go down that rabbit hole, I think we, I think we should move on to invocations. Um, right. Well, don't worry. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be revisiting this for pretty much every single one that we bring up. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, yeah. We. Now, um, most of most there are t there are two there are two changes that happen when it comes to when it comes to um when it comes to invocation. And first off, instead of going with a instead of going with a universal approach, we have three tiers of in of invocation. Um, you can have uh, um and any court and Eldric, um, and I I. It seems that the approach that you can have, that you have with it is so at um so at say third level you can have two invocations of of any kind, at fourth level you can have three invocations total. Two of them can be of an, of any kind, but and one of them has to be a court invocation. Um. And the the other thing the other the other um aspect. Is the fact that when you can learn a new invocation that has that has um, no tag, you can instead learn you can instead choose to learn a exploration knack, and that ties into a thing that I'll talk about later that I really don't like, and I'm sure you know neither does Ash. Mm -hmm. um, I do think I do think more more na more knacks. We saw bits of knack swapping in some of the other classes. Or the the ability to substitute one one thing for an exploration knack, but we, I think we could have used more. I think we could have used more of that, especially with some classes that would have some would have some natural um, cross play with that kind of thing. Right. I I so one thing I'll say about this is I actually do like the idea that Eldritch seems to have more of a combat focus, and Court seems to have a lot more of a utility focus. I like the fact that they split these up. Because you could do, you could take a few different approaches, which is to balancing these features. One approach is, uh, I'm gonna give you so many that your baseline is going to be covered that you sort of feel you feel lulled into a false sense of security that you sort of you can get away with using a lot more utility stuff. You you see this a lot with like spells and magic items. If you if I give you magic items that give you several different kinds of spells, you'll see a lot more casting of said spells, even if they're not something that the player would ever take just because they have access to it. And that'll even bleed into their, their normal allocation of spell slots. The other approach is to say, all right, 
only some of these are going to be available. The slot can only be filled by something that's not really for an explicit combat purpose, and that's that's a fine solution for it. Mm-hmm. And as when we eventually get down to the exploration acts, they're basically just Eldritch invocations anyway, so there there wasn't much of a... Half of them are, yeah. Yeah, they say you probably saw that already. Is is they're basically you know, like normally I would mark that in blue because oh sweet that's that's so awesome I get to I get to learn about the the Eldritch Interstellar Highway and what advantages my character gets there. But no, it's just other stuff that's mostly just taken from core. Yeah. Um. Let's see. At third. At anyway. At third level. <clears throat> oh, I was. We start Exploration Next at second level, skipping that because we, we're covering Exploration Next later. Pack um, Boon? Pack Boon at third, and once again we have Pact of the Blade, Pact of the Chain, and Pact of the Tome. Um, it looks like they don't. Op- it looks like they operate more or, le- more or less the same. Um, it will always amuse me that someone could take the Hexblade subclass but not take Pact of the Blade. Um, I know wh- I know why that's the case. It's just funny to me. <laughs> right. Um. And because 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 of that, I st- I don't know about you, but I will. But I um. I've al- I've always found I've always found Pact of the Chain to be the uh, of the original setup to be the weakest entry. Of them, I know that I know that um. That in Unearthed Arcana, the Faithful, they had they had put in a couple experimental other other um pa- packs, that being Star Chain and um Palace and Talisman. Um, although Talisman actually made it in, mm-hmm. but uh, I usually I usually consider Book of Shadows to be the weaker version, just because the the find the familiars that you got were particularly. Yeah, imp, pseudo dragon, quasit sprite, or any tiny or any tiny creature of CR one half or less. That's that's actually pretty good. Um, There's a lot that that builds. I will say that Pact of the Chain here is slightly better because because of um because of the last sentence on it. Additionally, when you use Eldritch Scythe, you can choose you can choose to deliver the attack through your familiar as though you had cast a spell with a range of touch. That I like. We well, could always deliver uh, touch attacks through your familiars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Eldritch Scythe like doesn't, doesn't count. It. But remember that Eldritch Scythe no longer counts as a spell; it's a class feature. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, well, it's, also, it's smart of them to include that, though. Yeah, a yeah. little bit of idiot proofing. Mm-hmm. Um, also, uh, side side note: I actually did a search through all the documents we've done, and I was way off. It's not not any of the class documents we followed. The whole change, getting a specific spell and changing uh, little bits about yourself aesthetically based on uh, nature aspects was actually the uh, from the origins document. The invocation of the Eladrin Lords um, uh, thing on one of the backgrounds. Oh, the good. I'm glad that you had that up because we're going to be going. We're going to be bringing that document up uh, probably near the end of this. Okay. I have it open then. <laughs> um Now when it comes... now um let's see, then then there's ASI, we know how that works, skipping that. Um at fifth level you get extra blast, so when choosing when you use ray, scythe, or spasm, you can do so twice instead of once. At eleventh level you can use it three times at once, at seventeenth you can use it four times at once. It's basically ex it's basically the fighter's extra attack. Yeah, and it, and it's uh, it's a little weaker than Eldritch Blast as a cantrip, which could go up to five rays. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, and that, then we get then we get to the then we get to the invocations. Because yeah, so we've got several pages of invocations. Um, yeah, but there are some here that are in the in the base game, such as uh, Armor of Shadows, where you are always under mage armor. One of the best indications to take. 
Oh, wait, did they change? Wait, wait, armor shed, constant effect. So they actually changed that because you used to be able to cast it at will in the other one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you're just always under mage armor, including when you're asleep. Mm -hmm. Um... There are there are some there are some that I'm not there are some that I'm not a fan that I'm not a I'm not I'm not a fan of because of the whole just adding numbers thing we've talked about like beguiling influence which is you gain proficiency in deception and persuasion if you're already proficient you instead get an expertise die They still have the ever popular agonizing blast Mhm mm because of course you do Yeah I have a few. They have Eldritch Breath, which is an Eldritch Ray feature. This one, this one is, uh, let's hear. Dreadful Word is identical. Some of these I'm going to go through and call out as just being identical mm -hmm. from the from the core book, more or less. Dreadful Word is is identical to basically the core. Uh, Eldritch Breath gives you a cone attack for Eldritch Blast. That's actually really cool. Mm -hmm. It tur it turns your Eldritch Blast into. A breath weapon, yes. That deals 1d10 times your proficiency bonus. What? That's what it says. I mean, prerequisite is 7th level, but what? It's good. Look at the look at the interesting, rather interesting recharge tag. Once you use this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. Otherwise, you regain the use of this feature after you spent 5 spell points to cast a spell or use other features. So, just so they did cowboys. actually, this is my one concession to these designers across this document, they actually did make use of the of the spell point feature mm -hmm. being different, slightly, from the spell slot feature. This yeah, is but by, by spending spell points, you then get uses back of some of your invocations. That's fucking cool. Yeah. All right. It's I like, would... spend this other resource to get this other feature back, otherwise it's on timer. And, and the timer is a shorter long rest. Uh, if you're all out of spell points and you used your last Eldritch Breath, short rest. You get both back. Yeah. Jesus Christ. What? How, how refreshing that they got to this 14 documents in. <laughs> <laughs> it would be even better if they'd allow us to spend levels of exhaustion to get more of one or the other as well. Yeah, it's, it's a recharge. Uh, having a general recharge document would be... Uh, because I don't like the idea. The the idea of having a having a timer for how often it's okay to sort of break the game mm -hmm. is not something that you want in your in your game. Mm -hmm. You don't want to you don't want to do that. You want to figure you out want, something a little bit more a little bit want, more consistent. Yeah, you want and you want res and you want uh, resource exchange when you're trying to if you're trying to do something rather drastic within the game. You want there to be a sense of, well, you can do that, but it's going to cost a little more than otherwise would be normal. Not, yeah. oh, you can do that, but now you have to wait to do it again. This is, like, yeah, that, that's that, that's something you see in, in the idea of cooldowns in video games, but that's... You shouldn't be using the, the timer of the adventuring... You shouldn't be doing once per long rest in the timer of the adventuring day. Yes. You should exactly. be, like, that is an artifact of, the timer of once per long rest is an artifact of a game which had a completely different time scale. The, the fact that my wizard casts sleep and is finished, and sleep is really, really effective, is, was on a time scale of weeks and months. And on a, on a character scale of, this might only be one of your many characters, some of which are henchmen, some of which are player characters. Right, it's on a completely different resource exp expenditure, mm -hmm. and if they're going to do level up, they should probably they should really take a more critical look at these. Mm -hmm. um, Is think... Eldritch Grasp the same from Core, or did they even have Eldritch Grasp? Um, uh, th so no, but it's meant to it's meant to replicate something similar. A lot of different features, both across in the original. And a few add-ons would allow you to either push or pull, and they were two separate invocations, which was funny. A creature ten feet when they were hit 
And the one that allowed you to push them did it any time they were hit with Eldritch Blast. But the one that allowed you to pull them was only once when they were hit with Eldritch Blast. Like, once per creature. Per Eldritch Blast, if that makes sense. Um... I will I will note that the final sentence with Eld with Eldritch Blast, um, given given the whole multi blast thing that you that you're supposed to be able to do, um, dis disappoints me a little, and I feel I feel like this is be one of those things that I had errata. Um, the grapple automatically ends if the creature leaves your Eldritch Blast Eldritch Blast range, or if you attempt to grapple another creature. This is to attempt. This is to limit multi grapple. I get. I guess. Still, still is a kind of a letdown because I could. Because otherwise, I could easily see some. Some. I feel. I feel. I feel like. Um. There's. I feel like there should be an additional sentence that's that. That says you. That says something to the extent of one creature per blast that you have available. Mm -hmm. So if you can only do. Or one some blast, other. Yeah. Why can't I do, multiple. Is the thing. Like, let me do multiple... Like, grappling is not that big in 5th edition. To begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, give, them, give them some other end condition for, for Eldritch Blast that allows them to get out of it easier. Because I'm not even sure still what you can... So, you get to grapple it. Using your spell attack bonus for the grapple check and for checks made to contest and escape. Uh, can I... It's not clear to me that I can actually move these people... Upon having grappled them. And it's not clear to me. Because the grappling rules are. Generally speaking like. You grab a creature. Your speed is half. Like you can move them around at half speed. And they can't move away from you. Like I think their speed is dropped to zero. When, uh, upon a successful grapple. And uh -huh. so it's not clear to me. How this interacts with that. At all. Because you're grappling them at range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing I note is it's a good thing that, but we we should examine because it's probably going to change. In the first ten levels, you only get one invocation with the Eldritch tag, which is good, because theoretically speaking, this might have an interaction with Eldritch Grasp. Mm -hmm. As an action, you could use your Eldritch Blast against all creatures within thirty foot cone. Mm hmm. And if you could get Eldritch Grasp on top of that, you could grab all of them in one. Right. So it's when a creature, when you hit a creature, that's probably, if we're doing rules as intended, they probably wouldn't let me grapple all of them at once. But theoretically speaking, if, I, if I'm if i of high enough level to have both those features, I feel like that's something I should be able to do. Yep. Regardless of the ambiguity of what it is that it means to grapple these creatures, I don't know why they said grapple. They should have just said speed reduced to zero. Because I don't think I can move these guys around with my Eldritch Blast after I've done this. Or force them prone. Or force or, them prone. Or, or do would... any of the other grapple things. I think it just holds them in place. And if it doesn't hold them in place, like, this is a weird... Normally, normally I don't have an issue with this kind of ambiguity. Everybody knows me. Uh, this is... But grapple is already this kind of... Has always existed in this weird mechanical space except in fourth edition and this i i don't know what this actually does i don't know what grappling means because if i if my character starts moving do the creatures grab or the, does the one creature grappled by me start moving with me can i attempt to move them at half speed do i have to be next to them no, at half I, speed? I i i think it's implied that they are Stationary because if they re if they leave your Eldritch Blast range, doesn't necessarily mean they left under their own power. Right, you you moved away from them. Yeah, and now they're outside of your 120 and or 60 feet and or range of touch if you're using Eldritch Scythe. Um, In which course, case, this is just a reduced speed to zero feature. Yes, and none of the other rules around grappling really make any particular sense. Yeah, you Unless you were just trying to short it, because this breaks a rule of grapple. And it, it seems like these devs didn't realize that people use grappling for other purposes. Like crowd control. I had a friend who uh, made his monk a grapple monk that threw, th threw people into other people just as crowd control. I will yeah. hit a motherfucker with another motherfucker. 
Another exactly. Motherfucker. Exactly. Huh. It's, it's so, so. This is just. This is a reduced speed to zero feature, but beyond that, it's like, well, we wanted to take advantage of the grapple rules. It's like, well... Maybe their grapple rules are different. Dumb. Yeah, their grapple rules are different. They're used for different things. They're multi-components, because they are a... It's effectively a subsystem of combat that wasn't terribly u well utilized in, in core. So unless they're using different grapple rules, and they have their own thing which says, if you've grappled a creature you get to move it around, and they don't have any particular understanding for melee. Like, they future-proof their own grapple rules that say, hey, if, if no matter what means you grapple a creature from, you're able to move them around the map however you please, uh, under these restrictions, of course. Unless they've done that, I have to go with the assumption of the, uh, the, the base grappling rules. Which... You guys, you guys know that is wrong. You guys know that I'm, I'm always in, I'm always in favor of dumb shit. Um, if I, w if I was writing this thing in, I would, I would have it that this is essentially a, ra a ranged version of a, of a grapple. Um, have at it. But you wouldn't. Wait a, but would you say like yeah. moving them? Because I don't mind if it can move them around at range. That's fine. That's a that's, that's a mechanic. A, that's, what, that's what I would. That's what I would do. This is a grapple. right. But you can move would you them. say like like my issue isn't necessarily the idea that you would be able to do the things that you can grapple around it. It's that those rules have an interaction with the assumption that you're in melee, and there are certain things which are not said because of the assumption that you're in melee. So things like, if I want to move you around, can I only do it at half of my speed, and does that drain my speed? I'd if I'm doing I'd this probably, range, I'd probably write it that you that you can move that you can move them at half speed, but that costs your move action. In which I, case, they need to say it here. <laughs> I I think I think I, th I think that um this is well beyond this is design. This is well beyond the the qualifications of a GM's judgment call. I am. I think that th I think that this is a case of someone, um, not someone not think not thinking th not thinking things through, because they were thinking, hey, let's a let's add a ranged grapple, which, yeah, that's, More. that's cool and all, but um, More. there's but because of the fact that there's no um, there's no ru there's no rule set for how grapple would change at range because there's always been the built-in assumption that it's going to be in melee because, well, usually it is. question for you guys mm -hmm. was grapple grapple was usually located in the combat section of the php right yes i have bad news and worse news what do you got I, I'm, I'm currently looking at the combat playtest document there is not a single rule about grapple in the playtest document for for combat for um, level up, for level up five E's combat, the huh. combat and turn based action, in fact, is what is what the full chapter is called. I feel like and we'll, I, I'm not we'll sure. review it later on, but uh, yeah, I'm um, I'm not entire I'm not entirely sure if that if that was meant as the tr the traditional document or more as a um, more of a ver more of a vertical slice of what a chapter is going to look like. No, that's a playtest document. This is from the the blog post, June eighth, level up playtest document number eighteen, combat. <clears throat> well, shit. shit. There's and with that there's... in mind, I'm gonna read the actual grappling rules of base fifth edition. When you want to grab a creature, wrestle with it. You can use the attack action to make a special melee attack, a grapple. If Which you're able to make all four... right. If you're able to make multiple attacks with the attack action, this attack replaces one of them. The target of your grapple must be no more than one size larger than you, and must be within your reach. Using at least one free hand, you try to seize the target by making a grapple check instead of an attack roll. Roll a strength, athletics, check contested by the target's strength, athletics, or dexterity, acrobatics, check. The target gets to choose the ability to use. If you succeed, you subject the target to the grappled condition. This condition specifies the things that end it, and you can release the target whenever you like. No, ac no action required. 
Uh, escaping a grapple takes an action, either strength or dexterity, contested by strength. Uh, moving a grapple creature, when you move, when you move, you can drag or carry the grapple creature with you, but your speed is halved, unless the creature is two or more sizes smaller than you. And then, of course, oh. there are special actions you can take from the grappled position, such as pinning. Right. Uh, they, that's sort of dependent on... That one is actually dependent on a feat, but that would actually be... Like, that'd be cool. Uh, a grapple creature's... So, grapple condition. A grapple creature's speed becomes zero, and it can't benefit from any bonus to its speed. The condition ends if the grappler is incapacitated. The condition also ends if an effect removes the grapple creature from the reach of the grappler or grappling effect, such as when a creature is hurled away by the Thunder Wave spell. None of this has any kind of interaction with range, except negative. Except going at range removes the grappled condition. This well, is just... If they thought it was just a reduced speed to zero thing, they should have just said reduced speed to zero, but I suspect... They forgot that there were all these other rules and interactions within it, and they thought, oh, well, this allow you. This will allow you to use that one feat that allows you to grapple, or to pin a grapple creature that you've done. Never mind the <coughs> fact that there's all these other rules and interactions which don't interface with what this, these people are doing. Would you, uh... Would you say this is starting to look like a, the whole multiple authors not communicating with each other thing again? I'd yes. say I'd say I'd say in this case this is this is an instance where where um if the authors were communicating <coughs> whoever wrote whoever wrote this would probably would probably get a dressing down by everybody else ideally especially since uh, like I said we'll, we'll go into detail you know four play test documents down the line guys but uh as a sneak peek the combat play test document has zero rules about grappling to the point that I looked up the word grapple and found nada. Um, which actually could be, I'm going to say this, this could be an indication that they're developing their own grappling rules. And it's a separate section. Yes, that could be the indication. Section. But as of right now, from what we know about general book layout for most of D&D and D&D alikes, grappling is contained in the combat chapters since it's a modified attack and it's not it, there it's placed as its own as a subsystem of combat or as a as a subsystem of gameplay has not removed it from the combat chapter if i if i may, if i may shift to something else that we kind of forgot um one thing there is one little change when it comes to agonizing blast and it's, it's tied, it's tied to spellcasting ability. Um, warlocks are not charisma-based casters. Oh, they can. Yeah, they're... you can choose between intelligence, wisdom, or charisma to be your spellcasting ability. And subsequently, oh, oh, oh. Um, agonizing blast does not is not directly tied to charisma. It's tied to your Sam. So, so in this case, you'd pick Wisdom because it looks like all of the good stuff having to do with Eldritch Blast and other spells is in Wisdom. Because, let's let's move away from Eldritch Grasp. I feel we're focusing a bit too much on, on Grapple. Yeah, we are, and let's we are. Go, let's go to the straight upgrade to Eldritch Spasm, which seemed kind of like a coin flip at first, to Eldritch Ingot. Which, is an El you can it's use a your... It's a fucking fireball. <laughs> Oh, it's better than a fireball. Mm -hmm. As an action, you can use your Eldritch Blast against all creatures within a 20-foot diameter cube originating at a point within 60 feet. So now instead of in inside of one creature, it's... I choose that point right there. These five creatures in this cube all take 1d10 times proficiency bonus again. Mm -hmm. And in this, in this case, Wisdom Save does not negate. Wisdom Save simply halves. This is a straight upgrade. You will now do damage no matter what. And... Um, I don't think even Uncanny Dodge could affect this, could it? Uh, correct, because it's only a Wisdom save. It's not a... Uh, deck save. Mm -hmm. It's not a deck save, exactly. Yeah. Whereas Eldritch Breath, Uncanny Dodge could affect it, in which case they could take half and then take none. Yeah. But this is just, hey, you guys over there, all of you have an Eldritch Spasm in you now. Oh, well, the, the one that it would affect would be, uh, would be Evasion. 
But neither on Candy Dodge nor Evasion would affect this one. Yeah. And so, and just like with the previous Eldritch Breath, this is, uh, again, you, you can only use it once per short or long rest, or if you've spent five spell points or more for spells or other features, um, you regain use. And then, of course, as we discussed, at short rest, you get both of them back anyway. So casting spells, Eldritch Blasting, using things like Eldritch Ingot or El Eldritch Breath, or I'm guessing there's probably one for Eldritch Scythe somewhere down there. Um, oh, yeah. You, you can... You would be able to do a lot. Now, as uh, Ash did point out, only one Eldritch Tag invocation is, is gotten in the first ten levels. So... You'd have to choose between things like Eldritch Breath, Eldritch Grasp, Eldritch Ingot, Eldritch Opportunity, Eldritch Repost, Eldritch Severance, Eldritch Spear, oh, that's sad, and Eldritch Tentacle at the very least. All of which yeah. have the word Eldritch, and I'm starting to doubt that it even has a, a it even is a word anymore. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's, it's one of these things, so Eldritch, I was correct earlier when I said that, uh, what was the Eldritch Spasm would probably have some more features down the line, but it's it's also now clear that it is, if you want to go with Eldritch Spasm, it's going to be a way heavier investment than the than these others. I'm not sure how I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a good thing, but it could be, it could be, uh, it could be a good thing. Mm -hmm. It could be a good thing. I would need to, this is one of those things where I'm not going to pass judgment on that. I would need to see it in play. But it, it, I think it's clear that Eldritch Spasm does require a little bit more investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it could lead to some really cool gameplay interactions. I'm not. I'm not well, gonna. I'm in total agreement with that. Get your whiz, get your whiz mod up high enough, and and make your your spellcasting, uh, your your Sam, your spellcasting ability modifier high enough, and you don't even need ingot. You can just spasm somebody, and they explode. Yeah explode um fiendish vigor i'm putting i'm putting that in red because it's just um it's just a, it's just for, it's just you get you get a you get a free use of false life and um false life that's identical to core yeah that's identical to core I didn't. I didn't like it in core. I didn't like it in core either, especially since one d one d four plus four th thp that you have to cast at first that you have to cast at first level for this. Um, meh. Oh, in this case, you don't necessarily have to cast it at first level. It's just that when you do, it doesn't cost spell points or material components. Yeah. Whereas you if just you try to cast constantly it give yourself enter every combat with temp hp. If you really wanted to, you could actually spend spell points on it to, to boost the effect. Mm -hmm. Yep. This is actually um, a slight improvement on the core. Mm -hmm. I am... Um, Eldritch Opportunity? Uh, <laughs> you can... When a creature provokes an AOO, you can use your reaction to use Eldritch Scythe instead. I could see that being useful if you don't have a weapon at hand. Like, if you're if you're... Pact of the Tome, and you've got your, your grimoire out to do some spell casting with your cantrips, and something rushes past you to to get to one of your, your friends, you're all like, Eldritch Scythe, asshole. Oh, and there's someone else running with you? Well, they got a little bit of damage, too. The the problem... I actually marked this one in red, believe it or not, because it, it, it mean, might be yellow if it wasn't taking up my Eldritch slot, but I only have one of those, so it's 100% of red. Oh, yeah. Um... I could actually just get Warcaster. I could do as I much or more thing. damage. Yeah. This... And given given certain cantrips like uh, Booming Blade or Green oh. Flame Blade, actually uh -huh. not Green Flame Blade because that counts as targeting more than one creature. Uh, but Booming Blade, like that, would deal a ton more damage, and I wouldn't have to. I don't have to worry. They're already moving away from me, so I get to fulfill. Because the the comparison would be one of these is. Both of these need to fulfill a secondary condition to maximize their effectiveness. And so the advantage of Eldritch Scythe is that I get cleave on it. Yeah. And, but somebody needs to be next to them when this person is moving away, mm -hmm. which is potentially less likely, given that they're moving away and they're moving out of reach. With Booming Blade, I, have, I could have a reach weapon 
and have a wider area of influence, I can, if they're moving away from me, I already fulfill the secondary condition, which gives me a lot more damage, gives me a hell of a lot more damage, basically doubles the effectiveness of the of the spell. And I, in order to get, access it, I only need to use a feat. I need yep. to get Warmaster. Yep. Um, Eldritch Repost, which is if you have Spasm or Ray, so it can't be done with Scythe, uh, when it, as a reaction, when a creature you can see within 30 feet deals damage to you, you can spend spell points to use Eldritch Spasm or Eldritch Ray against it. Instead of the normal damage, for every one spell point you spend activating this feature, up to a maximum equal to your proficiency bonus, you deal 1d10 force damage. So you can make a single reaction Spasm or Reaction Ray do way more damage than it normally does, especially at higher levels. Um, I mean, you can't get this because it's an Eldritch Tag until level 7 anyway, which means your your proficiency bonus is at that point plus 3, right? Plus 3 or plus 4. Yep. Level 7 is plus 3. Level 9 is when it... Or yeah, sorry, right. uh, level 11, I believe, is when it goes up to... Is level yep. No, no. Level 9 is when it goes up to plus 4, yeah. Yeah, so at level 7, you can spend 3 of your spell points, which is nice into doing 3d10 force damage with your Eldritch Spasm or Eldritch Ray mm -hmm. as a reaction to somebody who just hits you. Um, I could see that, considering that we only have up to the 10 levels and we only see the one Eldritch Tag invocation, this is probably a yellow for you. Mm -hmm. This is actually the point at which I'm going to say that the restriction, the, the artificial restriction on only having one Eldritch Tag is too restrictive at this point. Yeah. This, there, there needs to be more than one before 10th level. Especially given that the ostensible synergy is with something... So, there's clearly a synergy between something like this and, for instance, Eldritch Ingot. Because Eldritch Ingot keys off of you spending spell points to cast a spell or use other features. So, the in order to proc that effect and sort of recharge that, I am already required to spend it on something. I could just spend it on a fireball. Mm -hmm. Right? There's nothing stopping me from doing that. I could just spend it on a fireball and then I get to recharge this other thing. So I'm already have I already have this hefty resource cost. Yeah. Or I could use if I had access to two Eldritch tags, I could use Eldritch Repost and it would be a little bit expensive and I could sort of fill up that bar a little bit quicker and I could use a reaction to do it. And then I would have my, instead of, I'd still be really, realistically speaking, waiting two turns in order to be able to, in order to be able to cast it. I just wouldn't have to do it all at once. I could, yeah. I could stutter it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, and the, the idea of not letting me do that is just pointless. Yeah. Especially and when this is half of the, the half of these are the Eldritch Tag. Because they they all have to deal with your Eldritch Blast. That's why they get the Eldritch Tag. I get it. Yeah, that's right. dumb. I, that's stupid I should, I should and dumb. Half of these are either contract, either court or Eldritch. In fact, two thirds of these I think are court or Eldritch. And it's I. This is the yeah. only one. It'd be really gay. It'd be really nobody ever says like it'd be really great in the game. If uh, we only had access to one magic item, or you you can only attune to one magic item, everybody understands that would be bad. But because yeah. we're not video game designers, we're tabletop RPG designers, and half of us are not really designers at all, but game masters who who think that they're designers, uh, look at these things and just come up with these inane restrictions. That they have no conception of how they're going to function outside of the paper that they're reading it on. Yeah, they're not thinking of a, of a wider picture here. I, I am so tired of, of, of listening and looking at people who don't understand design but are in a position to, to design and just ruin things that would other way, or not ruin, they, they make it mediocre, which is worse. It's worse, actually, because it ruins the experience for me. But it, for everybody else, it makes it the, the experience uh, bad, but not terrible enough to stop doing it 
and do something a little bit more productive with their time. Mm-hmm. It's so frustrating. The word you're looking for there is a uh, tepid. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, um, it's ridiculous. Monk, Monk it's, it's my turn to say it's really weird seeing things from this side of it. <laughs> I, I've, I've never seen Ash get that, that animated in such a, yeah. I, in such an angry way. Normally I'm praising these people. <laughs> um, I know I've seen you. I've seen you vehement in your praise, but I've never seen you this vehement in your in your uh, condemnation. In, yes. And truth be told, I'm not. I'm not. Fu- given given how critical I've been of of um f- of feet ch- of feet chains in third edition and Pathfinder, you get. I'm pretty sure it's clear that I'm not. I'm not a fan of um d- of double dipping on prerequisites. Um. Because that was the issue for uh, with them was oh at level one I need to plan out so that I can get my entire character. Any deviation from this plan will prevent me from getting the thing that, that I want to get at level twenty. We all understood that was that was stupid. Yeah. Even then, in video games, that's a stupid convention. But but usually in video games you can uh, switch around a little bit. You can you can reset in some capacity, and, and making the choice one time isn't gonna isn't going to prevent you from undoing that choice. In tabletop RPGs, it's even worse, because usually you can't undo that choice. Well, and this... I'm going to say that with what we've been seeing so far in these in these invocations, it's actually worse than Gore in the overall scheme of things. Because in Core 5e, there were a couple invocations that were like must-haves, mm-hmm. just because of how universally useful they they were. But even if you didn't have those must-haves because you were trying to just be that universal character, maybe you were going for a specific type of character concept and you just wanted different different invocations. It didn't reduce your effectiveness in such a fashion that your character became baggage. And in addition to that, outside of those ones that were considered must-haves, uh, you could build a really unique character. There were tons of invocations that you could pick from that were just like these little things that were either like they were really useful for certain aspects of gameplay outside of combat. Some were just really useful because, uh, for example, Eyes of the Runekeeper. You can read all writing. That didn't have a restriction other than, I think, a level requisite. Mm-hmm. And I, Yeah, I think it might be like fifth level. I'm pretty sure it was fifth level. But... If at fifth level you can read all writing, that's amazing. There's a bunch of places you can go in in just about any world where, oh, nobody knows what it says on these signs here in this ancient ruin because it's so ancient. I can read that. What? I can read that. I've got it covered. Like specializations, if you will. Mm -hmm. Not just utility, but like some of them would be uh, I can cast Water Walk once per day. And also, I can breathe underwater, and also I have a swimming speed equal to thirty feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, stuff like that. So I'm a little bit more specialized for an underwater environment or an ocean-born environment, stuff like that. My character is probably going to take that next level. Uh, one of my multi-class characters in fifth edition, because I'm trying to convince the party to uh, sail the high seas so we could get away from a cult and yeah. keep keep one of our party members out of their hands and stuff like that. So hey, let's do some piracy, and now I get to switch out this thing. It's really I don't have Eldritch uh, Agonizing Blast or Eldritch Spear or any of those things because I because I'm able to work with that character and I'm able to twist them into something a little bit different. I'm probably doing a little bit less damage than I would be doing if I was just casting Eldritch Blast over and over again. But I'm I'm okay with that, and that's that's possible to do in Fifth Edition. One of the rare times when it's possible to do that in 5th edition. The Warlock actually gives you the opportunities to make a little bit more of a unique character. Mm-hmm. I don't know how these designers regressed on that. Um, they regressed by giving the tag system. Legitimately, yeah. remove remove this tag system right here. Just keep the normal prerequisites of this can only be gotten at 7th level and used with Eldritch Scythe, or this can only be gotten at 7th level and used with Eldritch Ray, or you have to have Eldritch Ray or Eldritch Scythe for these specific uses. Get rid of the fucking tag system. Or Move just forward. open it up a little bit. I understand that they want to make these more powerful, uh, and they feel the need to restrict it in some capacity. That's fine. If 
if you need to reduce its effectiveness a little bit, I suspect that they don't. But if they really feel like they need to reduce the effectiveness a little bit in order to justify having more than one slot, that's okay. You don't do the thing where you can only have the one slot. Especially, especially since some. The fuck? We normally don't do that in video games. You have, if you have armor, if you have an armor system, you're usually able to put a bunch of different armor pieces on. And even if there's a set bonus, sometimes there's a, a you, you don't feel like equipping the set bonus for whatever reason. You could, you could get away with it. Mm -hmm. um, right? Uh -huh. Now, I, I will note, I, I like, um, gaze, as, far as, as far as court ones, I like Gaze of Two Minds. I can see a lot of potential with that one. Um, since you're basically be, you're basically being able able to um, see through someone else's someone else's eyes for a time, as long as they're willing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, we already covered eyes of the Rune Keeper. That's mm -hmm. infinitely useful. Yeah. Um, I did put a red. I did. I did put Eldrick Spear in red simply because the range is now 300 feet. Woohoo! You're not going to yeah, be that much of a sniper. Yeah. And now I, you can't use the the other shit. Yeah. Take the Eldritch Tag off of that. Mm -hmm. Literally. Eldritch Spear was... Like, yes, increasing the range to 300 feet made you a Spell Sniper, and some of the ridiculous shit you could do with the actual Spell Sniper feat and this, and Warcaster was, if you decide... It was already a gimmick of 3x three, of three stands, seeing if they could pump numbers high in 5th edition as they could in 3x. Yes, exactly. It, was, it, it was... never actually cape mattered, because the dungeon is 50 feet long. Yeah, it never, never mattered because your Eldritch Blast could already go 120 feet, mm -hmm. and you're only yeah. going across a 50-foot room. Nice. Now you can't use, for instance, Misty Visions or yeah. something like that. You, you wasted a slot. Um, yeah. Maybe it's just... All the, I'm going to point out all the rest of these mm -hmm. uh, are, with the exception of, of, was it two, I believe? Versatile could be useful if you could take it twice because then you'd have bla uh you'd have ray scythe and spasm i i feel like i feel like versatile blast should be a ba should be a baked in class feature at at a, at a certain level and you just get to choose between it yeah yeah that sounds that sounds fine to me um so the one thing i hate right now the one that i will mark in red simply because it literally shuffles into the void patron token first of all it's eldritch mm -hmm. so, oh really you marked that in uh shoot i marked that that's the one i marked in blue and it's the one i was about to bring up because it's one of the few that aren't because we should really move on from the well the invocation you know, soon because the rest of these are just yeah do you know the reason why i have it marked in red currently it's smart as Eldritch. That, and we have no idea what patron tokens do. Mm -hmm. We have no idea about their role in Enchanted Gear and Level Up. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I just have, uh, I, that's one of those where I was still sort of giving them the benefit of the doubt, and I honestly still am with regards to the with regards to this one thing specifically. In regards to like, hey, patron tokens, blah 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 blah. You're unable to sell it if you somehow lose it the next time you you finish long rest. You discover it on your person. I really like, uh, I like the flavor of that. Uh, I, I, I think it's, I'm a I think sucker it's... for it because I'm a sucker for fairy tales. And even if that item ended up being useless, I probably couldn't help myself from at least marketing it in yellow, but yeah. wanting to market in blue. If, if we knew more what patron tokens did, and maybe the patron tokens are the way you change your Eldritch Blast. Who knows? Maybe we'll look at Enchanted Gear and says, if with, with a token of your patron, the damage type of your Eldritch Blast changes to X based on patron. Mm -hmm. if, if that's it, sure, I will change that to blue in a fucking heartbeat. Yeah. But as it is, as we see it, it shuffles into the void. There's nothing to attach it to. Mm -hmm. Fuck that. Um, <laughs> I, will, I will. I will note. Um, sign of ill. O sign of ill omen. I want. I want to be. I want to be really petty and put that and put that in red, simply because of how useful that was in fourth. Whereas, 
Whereas in this case, <laughs> it's bestow curse by spending five spell points. Can't do so again until you finish a long rest. It, I, it's identical to it's identical. To yeah, I I really want to be petty about about it and put that in red. <laughs> yeah, let's um, let's move on to the exploration axe, which I've just marked the the section header in red. <laughs> they're all bad. It's just they're all they're all basically Eldritch invocations. Yeah, Book of Ancient Secrets, Mirror Mirror, Ascendant Step, Beast Speech, Eldritch Sight, and Devil's Sight, which were both invocations in core. Yeah, these are all. I these are all just I, nothing. Nothing about like I, you know, gen, maybe j traveling through spaces which are affected by magic or affected by the far realms, the influence of the influence of the outer planes. Nothing about generating those areas yourself. Nothing about advantages that you might have uh, going about, through those. Nothing areas. about being able to di being able to get info from from a from a coven of witches or some shit. Yeah, yeah. Why can't you make contact with the local cult? Why can't I do that? Or, or uh, I mean, uh, my barbarian gets to my berserker gets to make contact with the local uh, leaders. My warlord gets to do that. Uh, or, or you you can find places that are naturally attuned to the type of of patron you have. Mm -hmm. so, something so like that. A berserker who might not like people, who might not like people, is going to be accosted by every village he comes across, begging them to try out their porridge. Okay, and the and the one character class which is so suffused with narrative that they would not ex that they do not exist independent of their patron they don't that character does not exist and all of the all of the intonations and every possible modifier and, and narrative hook or whatever have you there's so there's there are so many things tied into the patron that i am having a stroke midstream attempting to list them <laughs> and there's too many there's too many and you can't give me a social feature included in the in the core progression, we which somehow functions off of this. We didn't get a social feature in the class features. We didn't get a social feature in the knacks. They spent all their time on the invocations. We often we often excuse certain design decisions based on the fact that they have to. They're working with five E. Right? All they have to... This is a level up of 5e. They're not making a new game. So certain things are not going to be as cool as we want. Uh, this is a port. And this is a bad one. This is this is like when Koei Tecmo ported fucking Tokiden and tied physics to the frame rate! <laughs> I so if you try to play it at 60 FPS, everything goes double fucking speed! You know... I was willing to put up with that shit in the in um in the in the '90s era of PC when no when everybody's graphics cards sucked. Not willing to put up with that now, which is which is why which is why I have to which is why whenever I'm playing, um, old school PC games, I have to I have to I have to put stuff I have to edit files just so just so I don't have um frame rate at Ke at Kenyan murder machine speed. Um, <laughs> but the the point is, and yes, Ash, the, the saying that it's a bad port is pr a perfect thing because we've this this is the document that has been lacking the personality we saw in previous documents the most. Yeah. So this is where this is where my my speech has to come in. Go ahead, Ash. I want to hear this. Mm -hmm. I actually want to hear this. All right, lay it on me. The fifth. Playtest document was something called Inspiration and Destiny. Inspiration was a revamp of the Inspiration mechanic in 5th edition, something which was oft ignored in Mildred's words, which I recently listened to. Uh, you don't miss it when it's gone. It doesn't really matter about anything. But when you chose your specific inspiration, your, your uh, domain of inspirations, there were certain things that your character could do which would force, if you will, the GM to give you a point of inspiration. Next was the destiny section, where you would have a grand arc from your character that you would basically select at the beginning. And upon 
fulfilling that destiny. You would gain a fulfillment feature, it was called. Mm -hmm. Adeptly named, frankly, if not creative. It, it gets the job done. And you would get some sort of cool feature which would represent this character arc that you had gone on and how you had realized some portion of your full potential had finally been realized. This is... Both of these... Both of these concepts, which were outlined in the fifth playtest document, are the Warlock's narrative arc. In full. They are the one thing which is missing from base 5th edition. In that there is little to no connection between the narrative of your particular patron and the choices that you've made and who it is that you're accepting magical power for in exchange for service and the actual mechanics of, of what it is that you get. What happens if you tell your patron no? What happens if you attack, undermine them in some capacity? There's no real rebound effect leading to an awful lot of homebrew around like Dale King's Mills Packburner Warlock, for instance, is something that I coincidentally, because I completely forgot that we were doing Warlock today, I just happened to watch that video again today, because it's well done. It's everything that's missing from 5th edition. And we come across the level up playtest documents, which are suffused with narrative, mixing the narrative and, and the mechanics. When you go to the Origins playtest document, they demand that, listen, if you're going to mix your heritage and stuff like that, it says something about where it is that you came from. It says something that you were a dwarf raised in an elven culture. It said, like, very, very declarative statements about the details of your character's life. And okay. here we have this fifth playtest document, which is all about incorporating character decisions according to their own personal beliefs and gaining benefits accordingly and gaining benefits which are specific to their choices and as mentioned we've seen as the playtests have gone on they've been more and more watered down they've been more in line with fifth edition in that you no longer get to you're just increasing numbers you're no longer producing specific effects you're no longer getting to uh benefits because you're the warlord who traveled to a town and so now you get some kind of special treatment or you're the berserker who traveled to a small settlement and now you get special treatment it you're, was specifically the adept document where we started seeing the the italicized short stories with the with the actual insert art that we started seeing the switch from the personality and rich narrative that was in each of these documents started fading. That's yeah, where we saw it. the things that you would actually get to experience during gameplay, mm -hmm. simple uh, simply as a course of of taking this class, started yes. going away. Yeah. Yes, and this is the class in which you might incorporate something like, for instance, your destiny and inspiration document into the core class. Why isn't there a note in here about the Warlock's destiny and how that's specific? And even if they're, if they're going to be specific to the patron, fine, let me know. Because I can't look at this playtest document and give you feedback on that in lieu of any information on the... If you're not going to give me the patron, tell me how the patrons are going to change the character in a general... In a general situation. Because this is the class that's made by the patron. So I have no information on the largest section of the class and the most important section of the class. I have... Clearly there's no connection between it and prior playtest documents. Which, which would have... If there was any class to connect the Destiny to, it would be this one. Because, again, that's the entire narrative arc. And you could even put a, a small twist in there about how if you don't fulfill your patron's destiny, you instead get this other thing. It's the one place where you could not only include the destiny feature, you get to iterate on it. You want to And I don't understand. I'm not... Listen, mm -hmm. if, if the rest of the classes are watered down in this fashion, I am not buying this product. 
And I will recommend that nobody else do either. Because we already have watered-down oatmeal shit that everybody else is already playing. I don't know who is telling you people to get rid of all the personality and creativity in your documents and to forget about the documents that you've already produced of fantastic quality, even for playtest docs, which, which make me excited and interested in your game and thinking about the scenarios. Instead, when I look at this, I look at something which is ported from 5th edition and, frankly, isn't going to work. This is sloppy. This is the worst of your work I've come across so far. Fix it. Mm -hmm. um, but with the and incorporate the goddamn Destiny document. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that that shit existed. I see this as a consequence of tr of trying to trying to do these kind of designs in isolation, and it's also um. You'll note in my in my entire in my entire lifetime as a as a as a dm and what and backseat designer and what have you i've gone through my fair share of play tests um the majority of them don't really do don't really do a chapter by chapter kind of kind of play test approach it is always one package usually it's a package that has some pre-gens and a and a sample event and a sample adventure yeah but those play tests are also usually made much later in development not as not a, not as often as you think. Okay, so let me let me specify. Those playtests are made when the core elements required to run a playtest, an actual playtest session. Because these, as these are being handed out, you're getting you're getting handed out a document that tells you about origins. Mm -hmm. That doesn't speak to how combat works. That doesn't speak to how classes work. That doesn't speak to how the destiny and an inspiration system works that doesn't speak to how spells work that doesn't speak to how any other system in the game works mm -hmm. at least with normal play tests they have the the primary bulk of elements they want you to experience as part of the fucking game assembled it may not be the best assembly because this is just a prototype after all but it is all the core elements necessary to experience the core feature of the game in one place. This this chapter by chapter thing was kind of experience. It, it, was, it was it was kind of fun to, to experience at first because you were like, "Oh, what's the new thing we're gonna see next time?" We start hitting the adept and beyond stage, and we stop getting as much. Uh, we start having less expectation and more apprehension, or not not apprehension. Um, apprehension might actually be a pretty good word because we're sort of like cringing and looking at it, like, "Wait, wait, where's this yeah. going? Where's yeah. this going?" Yeah, apprehension then is the best word. Yes, you're lo you're and looking then, to you're looking to the left, and then you're and then you're you're on a plane. You're looking to, you're looking out the window. Then you call then you call the stewardess and ask. Ma'am, is that engine supposed to be on fire? Basically, oh, or watching a watching a prize honor student slowly develop a crack addiction. <laughs> that's a pretty drastic one too, but yes. In this case, your drug is mediocrity. That's the oh, that God, is the weirdest remake drug. of a beautiful mind I've ever seen. Ha! And it is but... definitely the worst remake of Flowers for Algernon I've ever seen. Indeed. Um, but the the what's really bad is that some of these things that we've come across since the Adept have had sections that make us excited again. Mm -hmm. Small sections where we see that DNA we saw in the previous fucking documents. Yeah. And then it's nowhere else in the document. Mm -hmm. um, Cleric, cl uh, you weren't here last week, Ash, but Cleric had a couple of really cool tiny little things like, oh, you're... You're not part of your the mainstream part of your religion, so you're you're. It's easier to make friends with people who are not as who are not pious because they've been wronged by the church. But the pious don't like you because you're not part of the mainstream. Like it was small little things like that that you could choose from. from and I was like, "There's the DNA of what we've seen the entire fucking time. Why isn't this everywhere?" Yeah. 
Um, but before before we before we go completely off off the rails, and we're and I'm probably gonna add that in my notes because um, while I'm while I'm not gonna hold it against either of you about whether or not whether or not you end up getting this when they when they launch the Kickstarter in about 13 weeks, um, I feel like I feel like I'm obligated to simply to put a bottle cap on this whole adventure when the time comes. But I do think we sh I do think we should dip a little bit into the su into the subclasses. The pa the subclass um, for our time. Yep. Yay. Um <laughs> I, 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 I know, I know, but um we've but um that's been, that's been the tradition and I don't want I don't want to break it. I'm already fe I'm already feeling bad about the fact that we couldn't do this with the cleric uh last week. Are we are we are we are we going to add a new rating? Ash, are we going to add a middle finger rating soon? <laughs> Jesus, I'm gonna give that to this entire document. I, I, cannot, I wish I was a better orbiter, and I could have properly expressed my disdain and disappoint—not my disdain, my disappointment—for how this thing. Yeah, um, I'm probably get, I'm probably gonna end up making. I'm probably gonna end up using the um, disappointed Hercules meme when I talk when I talk about this on the on the usual medias. <laughs> um, <laughs> You can just clip my rant, probably, and put it on your... Actually, you know what? Do that. Clip my rant at some point and put that as a solo video. I'll... You will get views. Yeah. And you will love it. I, I, will, I, will do, I, will see, I will see what I can do on that. I've, I, don't, I, don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever clipped any of my videos before. Um, but starting from the top, Archfey. Archfey. Um? Huh. I didn't expect this. So, I have... My only means of evaluating these right now are on the basis of the idea that they will just be pasted on to the document as, as written. Especially since the majority of this document was copy-pasted from 5th edition to begin with. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I would have to say, so I'm evaluating on basically how well those subclass features if pasted over would... If, would function with this. And I might, I'm inclined to say thumbs up, frankly, because the Archfey features are very free. You know, they, they frankly make a great addition to just about anybody. I love You know, get some free teleports in there, get some free charm effects in there. Misty step. There, yeah, there's, well, there's one which is like, when you take, it's, you take damage and you can teleport up to like 60 feet. As as a reaction, I think that might actually allow you to avoid the damage. It's hefty. I think it, I think it was. Yeah, it's. A, I think that's your sixth level ability. Very very effective feature. So, and and frankly, there might even be some synergy with that and uh, some of the features here. There's nothing yet because I guess it, it has to deal damage to you, so you have to do the repose thing. So maybe you can't do that. But repositioning yourself before you pop off a. It was, you know, an enlarged spasm. That yeah, could be effective. It was Misty Escape, and a 6th level Puff of Mist, 60 feet to an unoccupied space you can see, and you turn invisible until the start of your next turn or until you attack or cast a spell. There you go. It's it's very effective. So, yeah, I'll give it a, I'll give it a thumbs up because they would have to they would have to do worse than just pasting the features over. Mm-hmm. Don't uh, don't tempt fate there. I'm tempting fate. Oh, I want to. I want another excuse that. Listen, I've been a bit. Of, bit of, I was in a design slump for about five minutes, and I need that. I can feel the spite fueling my decisions. Because that's what fuels all your decisions, as we discussed. That. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> okay, Celeste. So this has been great. In spite of how I sound, this has been great for me. Um, rage, rage is all. Rage is always very therapeutic. Um, celestial. Celestial. That one was a little bit. Again, just evaluating off. Of, they had like a heal. They had like a a dice pool of healing. They had some. I don't know. Thumbs in the middle. Thumbs in the middle. I don't see that interacting positively with any of the 
with with any of the invocations as presented. I don't know if they would be able to include if they would have the wherewithal to include any exploration acts. I don't know if they I don't know what they would do here. Mm -hmm. I just don't. All right. Um fiend. I'll give it a thumbs up. It's primarily extra damage. Extra damage and if you kill something you get that tasty tasty temp HP. Yeah. It's Fiend pretty pretty, yeah, pretty easy to work with, right? Yeah. Um, Fiend, the only thing is, you know, it's it's basically a Faustian bargain at that point. Yeah. <laughs> if if nothing else, I think people will still be able to turn this this class into a combat monster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we just had literally no use for that. <laughs> Ghost in the machine. I don't think he's. He said. Uh, say, if that, don't remind me. They don't say the M word uh, of of a class of documents that I have no intention of interacting with ever. All right, great old one. Great, great old one. I'm gonna give that a thumbs in the middle. It's not like they're gonna make use of any of the. They're not gonna make use of any of the the social implications of the of a. It's a fucking Cthulhu following you around. This is why I prefer the term Star Pact, as I mentioned as I mentioned when you were AFK. Um, I No, no, no. So, so here's my thing. I, I don't like the idea of, of an ambiguous uh, sort of neutral star entity. I'm, I'm fine with there being other entities out there that exist beyond the stars and having specific packs with them. I don't want the generic one. If I get Cthulhu, I want Cthulhu. That's something you, like you have to go all in on that. You can't you can't allude to it. You know, you have to, it has to be designed by a specific type of person who's done who's who's done work with that and sort of crack the code for whatever their individual RPG is. Um, Hexblade. Look at that! A thumbs up. Uh, because they might they might give you an invocation. They'll, they'll probably have the Eldritch tag. Who knows? Uh, that lets you steal maneuvers. Mm -hmm. um, funny might even let you take an additional times to steal additional maneuvers. Yeah. Um, funny thing. That's that's something that they could twist to have synergy with the rest of this document and the other documents that they've put in place, mm -hmm. which is something nothing else we've discovered we've discussed so far. Uh, a qualification nothing else we've discovered discussed so far has met yeah um funny thing funny thing um i remember i remember at one i remember at one point when I, I, one of my um the the last time i play the last time i played a warlock um i i wanted to go with i wanted to go with hexblade and i wanted to double dip and have pact of the blade um but because of the fact that my ba that my background had an had a ancestral pact with the Raven Queen, my G my GM had my GM tried to nudge me a couple of times saying, "Don't you want to take Don't you want to take Ra Raven Queen as your as your patron?" It's like, "No, I'm taking Hexblade." because um, Raven Queen was from a was from a UA, if I recall, and it yes. was not it wasn't good. Was, was the problem? Which we'll get we'll get to it that was, in a minute. It was a, if. Go ahead. We'll get to that one. We'll get to that one in a minute. All right. Um, Lurker in the deep. Uh, I have to be honest with you. I I am actually not. It's from Sorcerer and Warlock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm vaguely familiar with like Mike Merle's work on it's sort of like a Kraken style patron. Yeah, but so it's just it's but... just a deep one. Mm -hmm. Um, genie. Just I'm a little bit more familiar with. I'll give it a thumbs up again because just the features sort of exist independently mm -hmm. and give you additional stuff. Um, Raven Queen. I I shouldn't be giving as many thumbs up, especially after that that speech about how the patron <laughs> makes the character. Yeah. But it, the thing to keep in mind is in the base five E warlock, a lot of the the invocation prerequisites. Any any time 
uh, prerequisites were double dipped on both level and something else. It was based on your character. It was based on your character. So I'm thinking of I'm I keep I can't keep myself from looking at the base five A warlock and it bleeding it how it would bleed into that class structure would bleed into your uh, your chosen patron and the the choices that you would make as a consequence of it because there were certain invocations which were locked behind your patron's choice mm -hmm. and that but that had this rebound effect or reverb that reverberated through your choices like a second time to where everything after like it, 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 this symbiosis of features where you would take your invocations and they would kind of feed into the pact that you whatever pact you had made but the pact you had made would then sort of it was like your character sheet was iterating on itself and and would then morph it sort of feed it spread its own roots into the invocations that you had chosen and it would it, it would influence your character decisions further and that's where so much of the juice was and that's that's what i'm imagining but that wasn't iterated on here you just see a lot of combat features which you can only take once before 10th level and and who knows it, your second one might be 14th level for all we know or something else we don't know when you get that second tag we know that you get a second eldritch tag but we don't know when you get it mm -hmm. and i think we know we also know that you get the third eldritch tag but we also don't know when that one is mm -hmm. i so, so what I'm imagining these things, it's like, don't take my thumbs up for praise. It's just the the features will stand on their own as being what the player asked for, hopefully. Yep. If they're not tampered with. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not my praise for, for the iteration of the class. Yeah, now... The, now, um, next is, um, I th did you get, now, did you give, in, before you did that tangent, did you give your, um, rating on Raven Queen? No, I didn't give the rating on the Raven Queen. The Raven Queen was basically a boneless hexblade. There was a lot of crossover between the different features, and on top of that, the Shadow Sorcerer was released at a, at a, maybe not the exact same time, but at a similar time. So you would have, like, the in the UA, you would have the ability for your, a Shadow Sorcerer to, like, summon a Hound of Shadow, and then you had the Hound of Ill Omen for the... I believe for the Hexblade, it was still part of that one. So if you wanted to play a Malazan-style character, it was it was a great time to be alive. Uh, you get a multi-class of two of those. And the Raven Queen was just kind of sitting there, it's like, well, they, you got this... You, you have a familiar plus was most of your features and you had a lot of passive shit that you would have access to didn't really feel like you were going out into the world to enact the raven queen's will and and make sure the those who were supposed to be dead would stay dead mm -hmm. it was it was a lot of passive shit so i'm gonna give it a, i'm gonna give it a thumbs down yeah. i don't even know if that one actually made it into a to an official rule book yeah um Seeker. And if it did, it would have been heavily changed. Yeah. Seeker. The Seeker. Was this another UA? Yes. The Faithful. What's up? UA the Faithful. The Faithful. The Seeker. This was... This interested me conceptually. I'll give it a thumbs in the middle for mechanical mining. Mm -hmm. Or for mining the mechanics. Is how I should probably phrase that. I don't have much to comment on it beyond like, hey, there were there were features in here I found cool, and there was a narrative through line that I found interesting, if not iterated on properly. Mm -hmm. Um, and. I'll be honest with I'll be honest when it comes to the concept of the of seeker that's another case where I want where I want to be um petty <laughs> because because I end up thinking I end up thinking of the seeker class um from um for, from 4th edition 
which was completely different. A lot of people made green arrow jokes about it because it was it was trick arrows all day. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the but um last is undying. The undying. I'm going to give the man. I loved reading through the flavor of that. The idea that there would be. Because it was around this time where I was investigating, like, sort of like good undead or something like that. And I think there was a little bit more of an inclination when the UA first came out. They made reference to the the undying liches of the, the good aligned liches of, of, like, elven courts that would stick around and refer to the basically help out the various uh, kings and queens uh, as they progressed onwards so you would build up this undying i almost because i almost said living this undying library of of knowledge and advice that the rulers could access and that was that was such a fun through line that it sort of carried my interest for the rest of the class and so I'll, I'll give it a thumbs in the middle. It's another mechanics and narrative mining. Mm -hmm. But overall, I don't think it's I don't think it's an exaggeration on any on any front that this is the worst playtest document that we've seen because it is way too, it there's way too much there's way too much copy pasta from from Five E with changes that make very little sense. Um. Look how many dead fucking levels there are in this document. There's two. Yeah. Levels where you get absolutely. Have we right. have we had dead levels in earlier documents? I think we might have been in like one or two, but like we had, wizard, we had them in so the in, wizard, but the but even the core wizard had a lot of dead levels. Well, no, the wizard had dead levels, but it was but it was counterbalanced by the the sheer, um, you know, by the by the spell levels. Right, which even I normally don't accept, but I can. I can I can grumble at it satisfactorily. Yeah, it's it's. I don't. I am legitimately apoplectic, as I've said before. That 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 word, that word that I love so much. I like lots of words, but that one's a really good one because this it's a travesty. It's outright. The opposite of what we had come to expect from from level up. It's it's like someone else entirely wrote these documents. Like this I was is about not to mention that. I was about to mention that. Hey, this actually doesn't seem like it was written by multiple people. This looks. This seems like it was written by one person. One person who doesn't get the point. Somebody who is extremely... I'm wondering if one of my freelancers wrote this. Because I, I had one freelancer. I, I will not mention their name, so it's to not publicly embarrass them. But I had to have a fight with them over why I was not going to pay them hundreds of dollars for something that was ripped off the 5th edition SRD. I mean, if it's a rip-off, you owe them zero. You owe them nothing. Nada. Yeah, I, I, and, and how I wasn't really concerned with the legal aspect so much as if... The people who, if my backers wanted me to rip off the 5th edition SRD, or wanted to rip off the 5th edition SRD, they That's could have done that themselves. They didn't meet, They didn't have to pay me hundreds of dollars to do that. And if I wasn't intrinsically opposed to doing that, I would do it myself and not pay somebody else hundreds of dollars to do, to do that. Exactly. This... Clearly, N World needs, the same, needs to give one of the writers the same treatment. I I All right, uh here here's the deal. Where would you guys put the social abilities? Where did the social abilities come up in the earlier ones? Cuz we can't we can't just normally I'm okay with just shitting on something because I'm able to give a lot of alternatives. So where we where we normally see the social abilities with uh with previous documents especially the ones prior to adept would be uh alongside mechanical abilities in some levels sometimes. Mm -hmm. Such as, packs, you, you notice how a lot of these that do have their, not, you know, discounting ASI, do have their uh, their particular features, have multiple features in most levels. 
Yes, such as I'm gonna take the let's take the warlord for instance. So at six level you get call to arms, you get mm -hmm. martial renown, mm -hmm. and you get versatile exploration. Mm -hmm. Now I believe that let's see your call to arms is the one for that's a commanding presence improvement, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, versatile exploration is whenever you learn a new lo warlord exploration knack or replace an existing one, you could choose from fighter exploration knacks. Hey, that would have been something great for the warlock. You could put that in as a, uh, you could put that in as, as like, hey, you get to steal from wizard or Warsaw you get to steal that. from, you get to steal from the other full casters. Why yeah. not? And it, but. So where I would put social aspects, if I were going to put in social aspects, I'd put in a real, social one. Real quick, though, real quick, Martial Renown was the social aspect one, where it was based on based on your... Uh, yeah. Whether you're famous, infamous, a maverick. Yeah, th those were the three. Yeah. Uh, so for the first hmm. social aspect one, I'd put in third, right next to Pack Boon. You get... You, Pack Boon's... Pack Boon's easy. J, we we know what Pactoon is that we that it, it's almost ripped straight from SRD with yeah and it's a very minor improvement it, it, yeah tweaks here and there mm -hmm. so next to Pactoon throw in something social throw in hey you're a growing warlock in in such and such and because of your your uh, dastardly deeds or the the people who sympathize with the fact that the that your patron coerced and cajoled you into your pact or any of these what you know wonderful narrative things we could put in you get to meet x group of people based on this choose one of these three um you know like one could be fully in in cahoots with your with your patron because most of the patrons are not nice most of them are, are first of all they don't even usually subscribe to the the morality of mortality so you know the arch fey are still fucking fey that's oberon and titania that's that's the fucking zeely and unseely court mm -hmm. that's that's these are things that live to trick yeah they good live... is good is something that is strange and interesting to them Depending on your lore, like in in my settings lore, they're basically they were shadows of people who are trying to learn to be moral. Mm -hmm. But most of them, like they have serious flaws, not just in morality, but like in the understanding of morality. You do the it's, things. It's alien that. to them. Yes, and and so you know. One aspect could be you're fully in cahoots with whoever your patron is, Archfey, uh, Fiend, you know, Great Old One, whatever. And so you meet other uh, followers of this patron. They may not be warlocks or witches themselves, but they may be people who devoutly believe in and worship these particular icons. Well, and what would we call that Discover Enclave or Enclave Discovery? Mm -hmm. Um, Call of the Enclave, I think. Call of the Enclave. Now, is this going to allow them to... Uh, this is going to allow them to... This is going to give them information, I'm guessing, on a region. On it's a region, not going to allow them... Because it's, it's not going to be in every town, right? Uh, it, it, it wouldn't be in every town. It would be anytime you enter a region particularly close to your patron's um, attributes. Uh, you know, maybe there's a place that's... Um, mysterious and unknown and people who come back from it are never the same and so here's what we'll say we'll say like some something along the lines of uh when you enter a new re like you enter a region there is a place somewhere there attuned which, to the which is attuned of your to your, well a uh, place are inhabited inhabited by followers of your patron yeah uh, unless the region is like explicitly hostile in some capacity, or your yeah, DM might, your DM may decide there isn't if the region is is specifically, especially hostile, or or that they're in hiding, and so you have to find. You, it takes more. Well, that's, effort that's why the that's why you have the thing there is because yeah. your patron will let you know, like your patron informs you of when you enter a new region. Mm -hmm. And, Your and patron so, informs you of a location inhabited by their followers. Yeah. And, and, and then, you, then you have the disclaimer of your DM may decide there isn't such an enclave in the if, event that uh, the region is, is especially hostile. Yeah. And then, and then you have another feature of 
let's say your pact is unwilling. So, you know, this one we, we might call the, the unwilling a better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so y this is one where your your patrons going to be like, hey, stay away from these guys around here or there. They're, they're going to specifically tell you to stay away from people because they don't want you getting help. And that's going to be your hint of, maybe I should talk to these people after all. I don't like this pact I'm in. I, in fact, hate this pact I'm in. I want out of this pact. Maybe these people can help me. And so this could be better. one of they seek you out. Yeah, they they feel the aura of this terrible being who takes uh, you takes know, place. You want to know what's really funny? You want to know what it, you want to know what is you want to know what is absolutely hilarious regarding this? Um, for one, once again, the problem that they are stumbling around drunkenly and fall, and trip and tripping over their own pants regarding we're fixing. Um, no, it was a it was a problem that was addressed an edition ago. There were ah. epic de there were epic destinies where at the ca at the capstone it is treated as if you are n are oh. now the are now the one giving out patrons. You managed to get you managed to get your freedom, keep your power, and now and now people are flocking to you for this shit. That could be something that we, they could deal with on the destiny and invocation side, right? Which reminds, so we have we have two different flavors of the social feature. And uh, then I I think the the third one, if we wanted a third one, because really when it comes to pacts, the 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 pacts are one of two ways in in broad strokes, willing and unwilling. There is the, there is a third, which is the parasite. That's, I'd still say that in broad strokes, that would be unwilling. Parasitism, really? well, because parasitism is is inherently negative. Well, yes, but it, maybe it's you, like specifically in the Great Old One, it's you parasitizing off of the. So they don't know you're taking their power. Yeah, they they actually they actually include that like you're beneath oh. your patrons' notice. You're just siphoning power off of them. Oh, that could be good for the third one. So, so, so we have Call of the Enclave, Unwilling a Better, and Parasites uh, Redoubt. Yes, there we go. And it's a place not only to hide from the followers, like this would be like sort of a safe zone, a, 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 a place you can use to hide from both the notice of the followers of your patron and your patron's site, and the people trying to face against your patron because they're gonna yeah, try and get trying to snuff for you. out yeah they don't care that you're not in cahoots with Cthulhu they care that you look like somebody who uses Cthulhu magic and so we're gonna get rid of you we don't we don't we don't care what you say we're gonna get rid of you so this yeah. is something maybe more of like a scholarly location where somebody's trying to figure out how to use like okay there's they're above the ideological conflict they're more like well, I don't want Dendar to eat our son. So, his son yeah. in the celestial body sense, not yeah. our child. Um, somewhat more filling. So they're gonna, so they're gonna help you out. So that's gonna be something like, by the way, for the unwitting, for the unwitting, a better. Uh, if they discover you, you lose a held inspiration. But. But you gain the Pact Burner Destiny. That could be, a, that could be one that works. Mm -hmm. Although I think that one would be more um, more geared to maybe a little a little bit of a higher social one. Maybe in this one, uh, if they discover you as parasites for doubt. Um, it's a temporary thing, not not something permanent for this low level one. At a higher right, level no, one, no, no, like these are just social areas that you're discovering. For instance, yeah, yeah, primarily. I'm winning a better. Uh, yeah, so no, you're right. So for unwitting a better, is it would be like they can take you to a safe place where you are beyond the sight of your patron, mm -hmm. so that you can then discuss with, say, people who are knowledgeable in old 
old legends about people who have come out from under your patron and give you the the plot threads needed to go search for right. those if tools. you wanted to and stuff like that. But it's like yeah. if they discover you, you lose a held inspiration if you have one. So your patron takes it, it's like, oh, well, you let them discover you, or I'm unhappy that they discovered you, so I'm going to punish you a little bit. And stuff like that. So you feel a little bit... So that might... Because maybe, despite the fact that you are unwilling to have uh, to have gone along and stuff like that, fantastic roleplay opportunity. For the Parasites Redoubt, it's... You are taken away. You are... You gain the knowledge. This is one where you're not sought out, and you, but you're not straight up given the information about, like, okay, you're not given a safe place necessarily off the bat. With Call of the Enclave, this is a place that I am allied with, implicitly. And if I go here, people are going to understand that I have been gifted magical power by my patron. So, they're going to be friendly to me, implicitly. I am, I'm maybe not top dog, but I'm up there. Uh, with Unwitting a Better, it's other people who are enemies of my patron coming to seek me. With Parasites Redoubt, we need a little bit more because it's not going to be you are given information. You have an inherent understanding after having siphoned from your uh, from your god so long in its blind spots. Right. Well, this is going to be the thing: is they're going to give you information about a potential interloper who can use the information. You've siphoned from your patron. If you can convince them to give you safe lodging in exchange for this information, you gain an inspiration. So this is sort of a unique inspiration feature that, and this could this could very easily overlap with another inspiration feature, potentially giving you two. Yeah, which and reminds me, at first level, we're not just going to give you. So you're going to choose your otherworldly patron, and your otherworldly patron is themselves going to give you a destiny. Yeah, because. This is this is one of those things that without the old otherworldly patron you don't exist as a character. So part of part of your interactions with your otherworldly patron is going to shape the course of your life. Yeah, it's a literal and it's a literal destiny defining moment. That's why we're going to choose. So that's what that's coincidentally why I'm splitting those uh, features up. Is one otherworldly patron and otherworldly destiny is one of those is going to be you might not your destiny that you choose from that is going to be associated with your patron and its influence on your life it, but it's not going to be your patron's destiny necessarily there is going to be one for the archfey there's going to be one for the great old one etc cetera, etc cetera. uh but there is but you don't you're not going to be required to pick the one with the archfey mm -hmm. so that's going to be like your otherworldly if you choose the the fiend uh your destiny could be a celestial one and so your destiny is focused on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you're 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 coerced into a pact with the fiend, but you're working towards the celestial destiny to get out from under it or something. Yeah, you, you did it completely willingly, but you're destined to be redeemed in some way. Have God's got a plan for you? Yeah, whatever God that may be. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, patrons, I called it patrons herald. You got called the enclave when you enter a region. You're informed of an enclave. You sorry, you're informed. Of a location by your patron, inhabited by your patron's followers. You're treated well there, you're given food and lodging, and minor tasks are completed on your behalf, but not on behalf of your party. Yeah, because they way. aren't necessarily followers. Yeah. Then you have Unwitting and Better. You are taken beyond the senses of your patron by enemies of your patron. Your patron warns you in advance that they are coming. If they discover you, you lose a held inspiration. And obviously, I would do a language pass about, like, this is when you enter a major settlement or a region 
inhabited by enemies of your patron. Mm. By influ, I, I might do another language pass beyond that. I might include things like influential enemies of your patron and mm. stuff like that. These kind of linguistic modifiers allow the GM to sort of understand when they're not presented with a renowned system, which is explicit, uh, which they apparently they're going to actually actually the level up guys are going to have an explicit renowned system, but clearly any sort of social document does not get taken into account when classes are made, so I can't rely on that being included here. Yeah. So I just have to so I just have to make reference to certain language which helps the GM understand the scale. And then you have Parasites for Doubt. You're given information about a p potential interloper who can use the information you've siphoned from your patron. If you can convince them to give you safe lodging in exchange for this information, you gained an inspiration. There you go. So that's our... That, you said that's at third level? Yeah, next to the Pact Boon. You know, you get your Pact Boon from your... From your you're getting closer to your, your patron through that Pact Boon. So this is where... They start passing you information, or you start being, you right. start knowing what information there is. This is it, yeah. This is if there's any point at which you could do something with the knowledge that you've gained, this would be first up. Yes. So we're gonna put, yeah. So we're gonna put patrons herald. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then what are and we then, gonna do for a higher level one? For this, I would put this one at seventh, um, mainly because seventh is one of the dry levels. That's one of the dead um, levels already. Yeah. And so, for this one, this is going to be a little more, um, a little more tied in with the destiny altogether, because this is going to be either uh, helping hindering, uh, helping your your patron, hindering your patron, or doing something to siphon power away from your patron forever to expand upon what we already have: the willing, the unwilling, and the parasite. Uh, th these are going to be. Um, you know, you're going to be contacting much bigger organizations. Maybe, maybe there's going to be a, a specific person pointed out to you for. Uh, f let me just spit all out for the for the willing. You're a willing participant in your in your patrons' goals, and that's even your destiny centers around that. So, uh, let's say that you've already gotten one of the first fulfillments, not the final fulfillment, obviously, but one of the first fulfillments, like. This is going to be, you know, your patron calls out to you directly, says, hey, there's somebody else here that I've given my power to. Collude with them and spread my influence in an area that doesn't like me. Make, turn this area into my domain. You know. I'm going to adjust that ever so slightly. I think that we're going to give them... I think we should just give them the straight-up ability to establish an enclave in their patron's name. Yeah. Because I might call it in your name. That would work. And and that way, you Here, establish... Here's the into what you mentioned, though. So for mm -hmm. in your name, I'm going to mention something about, like, you're able to establish a stronghold. Because mm. we have strongholds. We know that. Right. In a your stronghold. patron's name. Yep. A stronghold that houses an enclave of, su of such and such a size, depending on the region you're in and what the largest urban uh, area closest to you is, whatever. You know. So, yeah, it houses an enclave of followers who travel on the orders, who travel to the location on the orders of your patron. Mm -hmm. So he sends them like a divine, the equivalent of a prophetic message or something. Yeah, he, 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 they send them the message, hey, there's one of my hands, one of my people, one of the people I have bestowed with my power, here, go and listen to them. So you retain the stronghold's benefits only so long as the inhabitants believe you to be a loyal follower yeah of the patron yeah if they ever suspect otherwise they will keep you out imprison you 
or even attempt to kill you. Depending on how, how uh, great they believe your transgressions to be. Indeed. The yeah. only way to recover the stronghold's benefits is to reconcile with the inhabitants or clear them out. <laughs> And so that's that's for the willing party when you're that's working. The willing party, yeah. And so for the unwilling party, the one who is likely trying to get away from being under a pact, uh, this next one could be uh, something something a little different. It, it's it's still going to involve uh, an enclave, but it's going to be you. Um, you're pointed out to an enclave, like like as per in uh, Patron's Herald. But you have an opportunity to inform the enemies of your patron uh, from a from a zone in which your patron cannot see. You know, you have the you you seek them out, find find this zone, and then give them the information on this enclave. In, in so doing, uh, you know, it's going to advance your destiny in one, one way, shape, or form. Um, and But you have to assist them. And you have to do it in a way that doesn't reflect back on you. So it gives you an, an extra little bit of, hey, try to do this without being discovered by your patron to, to continue to keep a little bit more power. And if you're discovered, then you get the Pact Breaker. Um, the Pact destiny. Burner Warlock. Okay, yeah. so that's, I like that. So you seek out, or you're given, you're granted uh -huh. knowledge of a, let's see here, we can say an enclave of a, we'll say stronghold, uh -huh. inhabitants by Enemies of your patron. Um, if you travel to this, if you travel to this stronghold, you are given an opportunity to what do we say? Betray disadvantage. Um, to because it's not going to be a. I mean, it is a full betrayal, but you're. But in this case, you're not trying to be discovered. You're trying to get away with it. Undermine. Yes, undermine is probably the best word. Undermine your patron. Uh, and if they, what would we say here? Um, well, what's you'd have the, to. What's the advantage for this particular one? So the the advantage is. Um, Someone who's unwilling is likely going to have a destiny that is not related to their patron. It'll still be an otherworldly destiny. Um, but uh, the, the, the benefit is going to be that this... Um, you, could, you could see this stronghold as... Uh, since it's away from the eyes of your patron, you know, you'll be able to stay in the stronghold without your patron finding out. And you, these guys are going to be no longer hostile to you. They'll be friendly, knowing that you're trying to break away from your patron. And it, it is essentially it's going to tie as, as a more narrative and mechanical arc for even more opportunities down the line. And I'm not sure how we tie that in with a destiny, maybe one of the smaller fulfillments. Because I know that the... Maybe they... Because let's look at the Destiny feature real quick. Okay. Uh, let's, let's do what the folks who developed the Warlock did not. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the Destiny feature. So they each have... I believe they each only have, like, one fulfillment feature. Yeah. You feel like, for instance, the coming of age. You get the... Uh, with the journey complete, you finally know who you are. Or rather, who you became along the way. When you oh, gain yeah. this feature, you immediately choose and gain the fulfillment feature from another destiny of your choice. Uh, what a terrible example I picked. 
What a terrible example I picked. Uh, so fulfillment feature for, for instance, Dominion. You get absolute power. Either through respect or fear, you become the uncontested ruler of your Dominion, and most simple orders you give are followed without question. Any checks you make to influence your subjects are made with advantage. In addition, you gain the lawful alignment, and you emit a strong lawful aura, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. So maybe in this case, you're... Maybe they give you your fulfillment feature. No, that maybe not. That, see, that's a little bit too far. Yeah, that's pu that's pushing it. Because because especially it's not like we're at the wrong level for it, right? We're getting up there and where you probably should be, but sort of implicitly, you're going to have a fulfillment feature from, like, presumably there is like your narrative arc isn't finished yet. Insofar what, as your own patron is concerned. What about getting your... Uh... Let me see here. Maybe you're able to choose another... Uh, let's see here. How does switching destinies work? Changing your destiny. Whenever you gain a class level, you may choose to change your destiny. You lose any features provided by your current destiny and select a new destiny, gaining its source of inspiration and inspiration features. So I got it. You are given the inspiration, gaining the source of inspiration and inspiration features from another destiny, just not the fulfillment one. Okay, that that's a, that's a good one. And then of course, if you're discovered in this act of undermining and betrayal, you're given the Pact Burner Warlock. Uh... Maybe they put ooh no no. So I'm gonna I'm gonna restrict that a little bit. Okay, maybe. Oh, it might be the pack burner. Here, here, here's my thought. Tell me if this lines up with the pack burner. Uh, so your your patron sees this undermining and stuff like that. Maybe they don't immediate. They're not going to kick you out on grass just yet, right? Mm -hmm. They say I'm going to withhold your des. Ooh, I'm going to withhold your chosen character destiny. So not the one that you get from being a warlock. They withhold your character destiny. Until you reconcile with your patron. Mm -hmm. Or completely turn against them. Right. Or completely turn, or for, or accept the pack burner destiny. Yeah. Now. Yeah, reconcile with your patron or accept the pact burner. Um, there we if go. This is a, Ash, if this ends up in a kickstart in in one of your future kickstarters in the next two years, I'm gonna laugh my ass off. <laughs> well, it's it's definitely making its way into Lords of Brackets because I love the Destiny features, and I already adapted because I already I have a I have a series of notes about like uh, bonds and flaws because bonds and flaws in Fifth Edition don't really have an impact on your character, but like, hey, what could I possibly introduce to my game so that players could pick up additional cards and class features um, at some sort of opt-in risk-reward structure or cost-benefit structure that was tied a little bit with the narrative and was like, oh, bonds and flaws. Each bond that you pick up lets you pick up something extra, but you also get a flaw along with it. How cool. Um, it's so, like, features like this about destinies and stuff like that, they, like, they were already making it in. They were already making it in, and this is just me iterating on it. Yeah, uh, but with with that said, I think I think we ended up going way way off the damn rails. Um, it's totally on the rails. Come on, we got to finish it. We got we got to finish it up a little bit here. What's the parasite one, Mildred? Do you have one? Um, not at the moment. I need. I not need the moment. To, I need. Sam, what do you got? So, for the parasite one, um. Parasite. To in order to be a parasite, we would have had to. We would have had to. Um, we would have had to give that. They would have had to take them the otherworldly parasite destiny. And uh, I think that for the parasite, as the parasite increases in their destiny and gets their socials and such, they should be basically siphoning away more of their patrons' power 
in a permanent fashion. Like, e even if they were to lose their patron, they still retain some of the warlock powers that they have. Because as a parasite, they've taken that for themselves. So, in this case, I think that this first social aspect should be... Uh, you are... You either meet or are guided to, you know, guided to someone uh, who, who knows a, a legend of a method to establish your own... Uh, your own source of power, essentially. Something where they can right. an anchor what is theirs... And the patron can never take it away. Using, you know, what you're given, um, you'll then follow these leads to establish that power. If you successfully establish that power, if you su successfully establish that anchor, um, and this one would probably be at ninth level as the other dead one. Um, right. Yeah, ninth level is what I was thinking as well. All right, I've got the name for it. It is the Rite of Apotheosis. Ooh, I like that. And this one's specific to parasites, and which is why it's at a higher level. Indeed. Yeah. So, so the Rite of Apotheosis is where this person, wh whoever it is, whatever's helping you to uh, taking advantage of the info that you're siphoning off from an unawares entity, I mm -hmm. uh, is going to give you an opportunity to. Make part of that power permanently yours. Right. I think what happens is you're able to sort of clear out or challenge a specific area. And you're, you give yourself, each time you, you, by achieving some sort of win condition, you, each time you do this, you give yourself a point of inspiration. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and... On top of that, if you if you manage to actually establish that anchor point, not just the win conditions that help you establish the anchor point, but if you establish the anchor point itself, uh, I think at the very least you keep. Um, your Eldritch Blast and Pack Boon if you ever get discovered and the entity tries to take the power you've taken away from it. Even, e even in the fact that if what you are parasitizing discovers you and goes, no, 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 I didn't give that to you, and, you know, yanks power away from you. If you've established that anchor point, you'll at least keep whatever your Eldritch Blast is and your whatever your Pack Boon is. Here we are. You're right. Your patron can't force you to. This is something. See, I don't. I don't even think the parasite would necessarily need to do this. I think any of them could do this. Here, your patron can't force you to accept the pack burner. Destiny. Oh, that one works. So then, for the parasite on level seven, what should we give them? Just the win conditions with inspiration then. Well, no. This is the. Oh, that's right. Because this is the. This is the higher level one. Yeah, this was the ninth so level. This is this is the ninth level. So for the third level, that was what? Uh, that, was, that, that was uh, if you share uh, information that you've been siphoning off of your uh, whatever you've been siphoning off the un unaware deity to uh, to someone who is interested and can implement it, you get inspiration. Right, and I'll say your patron may send someone or something to test whatever has been siphoning from mm -hmm. that. And then if I really wanted to, I could include some sort of penalty if he lost. Uh, but that's, that's probably less necessary because losing in the game typically means just dying. Yeah. You either win the fight against whatever you're being tested with, or you die. I'm pretty you sure die. that would turn out. Yeah, so it's it's pretty standard. We don't need to... I, I probably don't need to extend the test all that much. Right, so... And the right probably looks like establishing a... I don't think it's... Yeah, I don't think it's establishing a stronghold or something like that, because that seems, that seems like a really... That seems like a hefty cost to actually get the... Uh, 
to actually get the to, just to get a point of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, you know, every every so often when you enter, so it should be for the, for the level seven ability for parasites. When you enter a region particularly attuned to whatever you're taking power from, um, they're aware that whatever has been drawing power from them is somewhere nearby a stronghold, a stronghold of power of theirs. And so they either send, you know, part of the enclave after you and you have to fight them off, or they take the time to have a ritual to manifest some sort of lesser being that's tied to them. Like in, in the event that it's the, uh, the fiend, maybe they summon uh, one of the demon or devil kin onto prime material plane and those are sent after you, whatever, you know, that's, that's up for the GM to decide at that point. Um, Which means for right of apotheosis, even if I don't necessarily go with the stronghold or, or enclave for that, maybe I word it slightly differently, but for the right of apotheosis, that gives me the per perfect thing. There is always a servant of your patron in the same region as you, though they may not... Yeah. You are always aware of their direction and rough distance away from you, though they are not necessarily aware of you. <laughs> you can engage this servant in combat to complete Rite of Apotheosis. An arcane ritual allowing you to gain more power. Which means, I suppose, when we go with something like the Otherworldly Destiny, things like gaining an actual point of inspiration for your Otherworldly Destiny is probably going to be a little bit more difficult. and But also the, the abilities that you gain from that point of inspiration are going to be more useful. Yeah. Like getting extra spell points back. Yeah. It could be, it'd be something like that. And, and this is the perfect class for it. So we got the Rite of Apotheosis there. And then for the ninth level, so the ninth level one I called Eye to Eye, where you're starting to see more on the... Um, Yeah, you're starting to see more like you're starting to get on a slightly more equal footing with your patron because mm -hmm. you are now a person of of major power. Yeah, right. Even at ninth level, because that's sort of the perfect spot for like I see that as like in, in relation to the rest of the world. That's where you've like you've moved up way beyond most people, and everything after that is just kind of you improving past a way smaller group of people. So for eye to eye, that's where we had the one with. Uh... Let's see here. Oh, that'll be that'll be later actually. So for the so, what did we think about for the what was the seventh one that we were thinking about for the parasite? Well, for for all of them, let's let's look at all of them for seventh level. So so seventh level uh, for um, willing uh, willing participant with their uh, with their patron was they establish a stronghold and uh, attract an enclave. Oh. Okay. And, and then uh, level 7 for unwilling was the opportunity to find a stronghold of their patron's enemies that hides them mm -hmm. and a chance to undermine but if they're discovered Right, right. Well, I thought those were the ninth level but I think you're right. Those are the 7th level. Yeah, the ninth level was going to be the right of apotheosis that all three of them could use. Oh, all three. I don't think all three of them can use that. I think that's just the. I think that's only going to be the uh, the paras the more parasitic. Okay, so right of apotheosis will be seventh then. I think. And, and then well, the no, no, we're gonna, put, we're gonna keep that as nine because that's a better place to put it. Okay. But that's like that's that's going to be reflective of your relationship with your patron a little bit. Because your pa you could have a really positive relationship with your patron, and they might want you to do that anyways. 
Like, it could be a fiend patron. It's like, yeah, grow fat from strength. Uh -huh. Or grow, grow, grow strength from... Gain strength th through fat? What's the what's the Cabal Ember? What's a fucking... I can't remember his name. It's been so long since I played Destiny 2. Who cares? All right, so level 9 is going to be eye to eye. So what do we call the, the level 7 Parasite ability then? Um... We're gonna go with because what we have in between is we have third level, an interloper helps you helps you out, and you get a point of inspiration and stuff like that. And then level nine is you can go out and fuck up patrons of your servant, or sorry, servants of your patron, mm -hmm. and then you get inspiration. What's what's a good midpoint there? Do you guys think? This one, I think, is also going to be location-based. Probably something to do with settlements. Oh, I got it. I got you it. You find a cache of, of information directly related to the patron you're siphoning from. Yes, or a talisman. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, what do we... What's, what's a catchy name for this? For the kind of Indiana Jones... Uh, what do we do? We call this like arcane or eldritch archaeology. Mm. What do we call this? That's eldritch, a uh, El eldritch exhumation, as in exhuming a body from a from a uh, from a uh, a coffin or other mausoleum. I like that. I like that quite a bit. So here's the deal. When you reach a major settlement, you learn the location of, uh, how do we put this? Um, An ancient cache uh, related to your patron, or related to the patron right. you're siphoning from. Minor, let's say, minor artifacts. Or uh, descriptions? How do, how, do, how, how do we put that? Or records. Records. Yeah. Of your patrons' power and influence. Revealing of your patrons' power. Wait, revealing? The truth behind your patrons' legends. Right. Of the inner workings. Yeah. Of your patron's power. Or patron's power. This information... Information... Or... Artifacts. I suppose I, I should put, like, these. This is where language passes come in handy. This is how it typically works out when I'm writing something, by the way. Is I'll have to, like... I'll have to go with something first, uh, and I'll decide, oh, well, the, the, the subject-verb disagreement here, because I decided that a, um, you know, there would be a secondary option that either the player or the GM could consider, and so now I gotta go back, and th this happens literally all the time. It, you got to see this a lot when Mike Merles was doing that, Mike Merles having oh, fun out. So what you do is you change it to, these artifacts or records... Right, or records, which is what I just did. Records are always, are either, I shouldn't say always, that's another one, are either held by somebody who holds them, who values them dearly. Or within a dangerous dungeon? Do we just straight up say dungeon? Dangerous ruin. Ruin, yes. After that all, nobody if you want to... yeah. <laughs> else dare enter. Yep. 
values them above their own life. So you either kill the guy and take his you either kill the guy and take his shit or you go into this scary place here. Indeed. <laughs> Like the the idea being that like when you're engaged on this on this kind of level of of weird when it comes to your patron, it's you're working with people who are uh like especially if this is like a Cthulhu cultist. It doesn't even have to be a cultist. It could just be somebody who like was an adventurer themselves, saw the the eldritch ruin of a town as as people were turned into monstrosities and aberrations and eaten alive and and, and watched the civilization collapse and they've gone a little bit insane and this is their memory of that and if you try to get that shit away from them uh they're, they're going to go after you yep, they'll hunt you to the ends of the earth until you kill them dead right so this is something where it's like you have to spend time some indeterminate number of time. If you spend indeterminate number amount of time, uh -huh. for which I'll just put parentheses time. Yeah. Studying these artifacts or records. Tell you what. Tell you what. We're going to take a note from our boys here in the level up play test. Number 14, where we go down to the Eldritch Invocations. <laughs> and we look at the patron token. Oh, yeah. You gain either... This is going to be so... This is going to be so funny. Either you gain a point of inspiration or I would say you either gain a point of Inspiration, immediate knowledge of how to fulfill your character destiny. And of course, we would come up with some other means of differentiating your warlock destiny and your character destiny. Like we might say, whenever we refer in the in the notes for otherworldly destiny, we might make a reference to something like, "Hey, whenever we refer to this destiny, we say uh, otherworldly destiny." And if mm -hmm. we don't say that, assume we're uh, referring to the one that you made when you created when you first created your character, yeah. your origin destiny, I, your origin destiny. I would drop. Call, I would. When it comes to the I would drop calling the otherworldly destiny. I wouldn't call it a destiny, just, so we don't I'm going, have... I'm going with pact. Well, no, because pact the pact destiny? is the pact. Well, no, dropping the word destiny entirely, I think we should call it your pact geis. Because it's something you're bound to by the pact you made, and you have to fulfill it. Yeah. Well, that's that's the one thing that we mentioned is that this one wouldn't necessarily, and we can go back on this if we want. I know, but uh, this one is the one where, like, we don't have to. It doesn't necessarily have to be dependent on your specific patron. Then otherworldly weird, call it your weird W Y R D. Because I like because here's the thing, it's gonna work the same way as the destiny, right? Okay. I mean, I see, I see your point. You're, you're going to have an inspiration feature, you're going to have a fulfillment feature, and you're going to be the one guy who gets to do that. Uh, there's going to be a, yeah, there's going to be a whole sidebar for Otherworldly Destiny that explains that this is a destiny separate from Origin Destiny, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. We're going to include, probably the fulfillment destiny is going to be a little bit less entrancing than the other ones. There, or sorry, the Pack Burner Destiny is going to be less entrancing than the other ones. It's going to be something that you want to avoid. You're going to be like, if that happens, you're going to be like, ah, oh, fuck. I didn't get the cooler thing. I still yeah. get something cool, right? But like it's I'm not a really cool. Yeah, but not. I didn't get to, uh, you know, a seat on the court of the archfey. Mm -hmm. Right. I got something. I got something more mechanical than than narratively interesting. Titania didn't make me a noble. Wham. Titania didn't bang me. Terrible. <laughs> But, I wasn't gonna go that far, getting, but you know back, we were both getting back it. to san getting back to sanity. I think I think ultimately this is this is a case this is a case in point of 
there's a lot more there's a lot more that could have been done and this this um this particular I really really hope that there were some redrafts of the war of the warlock between when this document came up and when we inevitably see the see the final um so too but indeed next week we will be we will be tacking tackling um another 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 caster and and um I'll, and I'll have an opportunity to talk about the to talk about the lawful stupid problem next week Mildra, Mildra, pause for a sec. Sorry about that, folks. Bit, bit of a step, bit of a staff meeting. We'll, we will cut, we will cut, uh, we'll cover the f the final two components for the ninth level entry. Yeah. So with the with the ninth level entry, we already have the one for the parasite who can go around basically fucking with servants of the patron. Now, for the ninth level, for the willing participant, the guy who helps his patron, loves his patron, or at least doesn't hate him. Uh, at this point, this is a ninth level thing. This is something big. This is... Right. This is... Com I think that there should be... Hmm. Maybe a sort we, of signature... We could always tone it down. We could always tone it down afterwards. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking some sort of signature, signature power of some sort related to the the patron, a signature power um, from the patron spells you would get. But in this case, it's a, you know it, like a signature spell. It's always prepared, doesn't take up uh, materials or anything, and can be cast at whatever level it is without using any spell points. Um, or maybe maybe something something different. I'm not sure. I uh, maybe l let me tell you that, what if we did? What if we did to get a point of inspiration? You start the day with a point of inspiration. Your patron starts your day giving you new re uh, revelations about the the powers you two are forming, which gives you a point of inspiration at the start of the day. Which you're then able to use on your destiny or your mm -hmm. warlock destiny. You Can use be used on, on either one. destiny. Okay, that's that's actually good because that's versatile. Um, you, you're only supposed to earn inspiration for one destiny, depending on what what destiny influence you're you're receiving your inspiration from. Um, right. Which theoretically so, could be three of them because if in the previous one, we we've now created not a huge incentive. But a little bit of, like, you don't necessarily have to stick with one theme across all of these. Your character you, your character could be really fucking power hungry. Uh, yeah. And say they take the second one where it's like, you're granted knowledge of a stronghold inhabited by enemies of your patron. Uh, if you help them out, you're granted an inspiration feature of your choice. You could be, like, betray your guy in the second one. And, and not get discovered, because if you get discovered, you get pushed into, into pack burner. Right, or you're forced to reconcile with them. Mm -hmm. Maybe you reconcile with your patron after that little bit there, and they reward you with this feature that we're giving that we're giving you here. You gain a point. You whenever you complete a long rest. Upon completing a long rest, you're given. A point of inspiration by your patron, right? And yeah. we could probably include a little bit of thing there, like if you engaged in engaged in uh, any particularly offensive behavior to your patron that they are aware of. Yeah, patron that they are aware of. That is an important uh, distinguisher. Because we, we do have a, a, set, a, a very distinct uh, both pass and fail state for that, uh, that second feature of if you do it uncaught, you get, you get another inspiration feature and your patron is none the wiser, so you still keep your powers. Right. They, they can do this thing where they can choose to revoke it. Mm-hmm. 
that day. Patrons rarely do this multiple days in a row. Their attention is usually held elsewhere and are often too busy to hand out repeated punishments. To anyone uh, so useless or so offensive as to require to anyone, let's see here, to hand out repeated punishments to anyone they don't feel like making a pact burner yeah so the idea is even if even if you do fuck up a couple of times it's like well i gotta go over here and i still think that i still think i could get something out of you so i'm not going to make you a pack burner right now but i'm also not going to waste time punishing you over and over again yeah that's like future this is like future proofing against certain gms or idiot yeah. proofing against certain gms who are going to be like well you did it again you did it again you did again, so I'm just going to keep hitting you. It's like, it doesn't... Even if your GM has a particularly low bar for what counts as uh, particularly offensive, which is a phrase that sort of inherently restricts against having a low bar for that sort of evaluation, but some people out there are going to do it. Yeah. We have a second note here which says, don't do that. A second note that says, don't do that, because otherwise you're just going to make your... your players go away yeah you're just you're at this point you're just being a dick to your players yep whether you realize it or not so our last and this so our last feature for the i the last one that we need to complete for the eye to eye feature that you would gain at social feature that you would gain at ninth level is, is one hostile yes a hostile one so we've already worked with the enemies of the patron and potentially undermined his uh his plans somewhere undermined his influence in i think in this one it's going to have to be something a little more material and immediate to the patron okay either an underling stronghold I think it should be another warlock. Warlock? Yo! Yes! Another warlock of the same patron. Another and warlock. Of, what do we call this? I'm thinking something about, like, Tories or backstabbing or... Um... I think... Maybe. Huh? No, turncoat... Turncoat is not too... Turnco isn't dramatic enough. This is my only trouble with it. I know. Uh, I was... I, I was uh, thinking more um, usurpation because... Or, or, uh, or better yet, regicide. You're, take, you're taking your enemy's king. So, you know. Uh, beca and in, do, in, in doing so, the, the benefit is A, you've completely taken out one of the best pieces this patron has that you know their their warlocks are their biggest pieces and b you're gonna get something something of power from killing this warlock oh yeah oh yeah and of course the fail state in this one is if you're facing down another warlock you're can you fail you're just gonna die right well even if you escape they report, and you don't get an option to become, like, your pack burner immediately. Yeah, if you manage to escape, you're a pack burner. Otherwise, you know, you just die. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you target a fellow warlock. A warlock um, of the same patron, yeah. Of the Has to be of the same patron, because you're being hostile to your patron. That's yes. the theme. If you manage... 
to defeat it's gonna have to be it's gonna have to be kill yes or... you have to... <sighs> all right so kill permanently incapacitate permanently remove from your patron senses or patron's or influence something i want to say the reason i want to go with senses this is another one where it's like in design it's like cuz influence can be interpreted in a geopolitical sense right this is this is true this is true Whereas senses is like, we have an interpretation, and we've been following an interpretation of patrons where it's like, uh, they're able to look through your eyes and stuff like that. Yeah. Permanently yeah, move yeah. through your patron's senses, I think, says like, okay, like they can't, like your patron has no idea what the fuck happened to them. Yeah. Either you've killed them, or trapped them in an extra planar rift of some sort, or... Exactly. Exactly. Like, you eat them into the Far Realms. Or, and this is going to be the last one. Persuade them to work against your patron? Persuade them to work? Work against your patron? What do we give them for this one? Um, Milzer, do you have any ideas for this? What do we, if you manage to like fucking ruin another patron basically or ruin, ruin, ruin an, another patron. warlock yeah ruin another warlock or at the very least their relationship with your patron what do you what do you get for this i think there's way too many i think there's way too many variables so the the only thing that you could really put in is is some sort of boon um not boon in the terms of the class feature but boon in terms of you're get you're yep. getting your um you're you're getting so you're you're either get you're either getting the you're either getting the boon that they that they had or you're get or you're having it given to you, um, okay. And I think I think I think this is one of those things where instead of having a hard and fast list, um, you should have a list of possible su possible suggestions, um, with DM's choice. I realize that's a bit yeah. of an ass poll, but the problem is this is way too wide of a net otherwise. Right. Well, we could work with that. I think we could actually. I think he just gave us the answer. Basically, it's like I'm going to turn it on its head a little bit. Where if you persuade them, you gain one of the following. Because this is a little bit of a. At this point, if I have a list with three or more items, I'm going to put it on a. Um, Bullet. Especially, if, yeah. If my if my sentence has already gone on long enough, because previously I said something like. What was it? Uh, yeah. It was for the one where you were able to... The Eldritch Exhumation. Mm -hmm. if, you spend, if you spend time fight, uh, studying these artifacts or records, you either gain a point of inspiration, immediate knowledge of how to fulfill your character destiny, or, your, or a enchanted item. Whatever the thing was for that particular... Um, yeah, the patron token. Or a patron token, exactly. Or the benefits of the patron token. Whatever those are going to be. Hopefully they're yeah. not useless. So for this one, I'm going to say for one of the following. A token, we're going to say... In addition, and I should, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I have to specify, in addition to whatever loot you get from the blah blah blah, uh, you gain one of the following. An invocation of your choice with the Eldritch tag. Specifically the idea that you're getting a little bit of uh, cannibalism in here. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and, and you have to... It should be an Eldritch invocation of your choice or, with, or an invocation of your choice with the Eldritch tag that does not use one of your Eldritch slots. You have to specify that because right. otherwise this does not. Be. Yeah, this does not uh, occupy your eldritch slot. Occupy your eldritch slot. Yeah. Or oh, that's the language of fifth edition. This does not count against. Oh yeah, this does not count against your. 
uh, your el- uh, your number max- of yeah, eldritch. Number. Yeah, eldritch tagged invocations. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. The next one down is probably going to be something like we could say the benefit. We could say again the benefits of. Patron's token, is that what it's called? Yeah, Patron's token was that one Eldritch uh, uh, invocation that I thought was stupid as fuck because we don't have any way to measure its use- usefulness. But yes, Patron's token. Tell you what, because we already, because the previous one says, and anybody listening to this is like, you already said any invocation that you want. Aha, but when you do the benefits of the Patron's token invocation, twice. <laughs> and we still have no idea what that does by the way but the people that we send this to a dm world will in fact know and hopefully they'll make the patrons token something non-trivial yes one one does indeed hope because non a trivial if it's just a thing that's like Oh yeah, you're 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 a great old one follower so you get this little coin with the elder sign on it and it does nothing I'd yeah, be like, that'd, be, that'd be annoying. I'd be like, be you're fucking annoying. joking. I'd be like, you're fucking joking. This is a useless invocation. Going along with Mildred's suggestion, and I think we're going to have one addition to this, that I haven't decided yet, but I want to write down Mildred's suggestion. A benefit... What do they call the DM here? The narrator? Yeah, the narrator. Mm-hmm. Between... A benefit... Suggested... By the narrator. And if we could give the... the, We should probably give the narrator a little bit of uh, direction. What should we say? Involving? Uh, We could say involving is a really good... Is a good word because it's... It's wide... It casts that wide net that Miltra was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. But it still gives you a direction to cast that wide net. Yeah. Right. So involving the ones that we've gone with already are like fulfilling your destiny, a stronghold, a personal goal, or something of of this like. Right. Or, tell you what, knowledge of an artifact. I think it's pretty wide net. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah, that's pre- that's pretty good. Sweet. And then you said you had one one more bullet point to add. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what it because we already covered like all right, magic item, twice. Uh, <laughs> your choice. Let's see here. Uh, I could be. Because let's see here. I don't want it to just be. Because I, I wanted to, I, I sort of wanted to do something with that had to do with inspiration. But actually, you know what? Maybe another inspiration feature of your choice. Because we already have one where you got a second inspiration feature. Now you get a third one! Yeah, but and, and the funny thing is, this is another one where. Actually, yeah, this is another one where it's. Yeah. So this would be a second one where you were able to take another inspiration feature. But the funny thing is, you're not getting... uh, Neither of these give you a bunch of inspiration points. Yeah, it's just features. So you're still relying... You're getting more opportunities to get inspiration and use more inspiration features. But what you're not doing is getting more sources... Like, more... You're not getting universal sources of inspiration like some of the other ones are. Yeah. So I feel like I feel like that's as strange of a thing as it is to say about this subject. I think that's balanced. As strange as it is to say, yes, but you are correct. That is pretty balanced. <laughs> you do so, you're granted an inspiration feature of your choice. That sounds... That sounds good. Yeah, so let's let's go through the ones that we made. We have 
Yeah. Okay. Oops. Ian Ian World, we fixed it for you. Yeah. You're welcome, guys. All we have to do now is uh well, I guess we're not doing that tonight because it is it is quite late for these gentlemen. Uh <laughs> but is the uh is the actual otherworldly destinies that we would be doing. Yeah. So, the- <laughs> so yeah, so we have at third level we have patrons herald. You get to choose one of the three options. Uh, which reflect your relationship with your patron and the continued journey of your of your warlock. Yep. Uh, first off, we have called the Enclave. When you first enter a... Yeah, when you first enter a new region, you learn of an Enclave of your patron's followers. Uh, the, yeah. What was it? Yeah, you learn the you learn the location of an enclave of your patrons' followers. They're they're friendly with you. They they clothe or they feed and shelter you. They do minor tasks for you, but only you, not your party. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and they yeah, and this enclave does not. Yeah. And this uh, feature does not activate in a region that is particularly negative to your uh, to your patron. Enclave, yeah, in a region particularly hostile to. We've been making grandi we've been making great use of that word tonight. Well, I mean it's a good word, so I don't see it. It is. Wrong. It's I mean it's worth using over and over. Yeah, they offer you food and shelter. Um and tell you what. Whenever you rest at this enclave you gain a point of inspiration. You cannot gain another point of inspiration. Until you visit a different enclave. Or use the, uh, or use this one. Yeah. The previous inspiration gained in this way. And if I went back for a language pass, I would adjust that some. I, I yeah. figured it needed one more thing based on the, the things that we were uh, giving these other guys. Yeah. So then we have the unwitting a better, where people hostile to your patron learn of your location. If they discover you, you lose a held inspiration. Uh, uh, you are taken... A location beyond your patron's se- uh, senses. Mm-hmm. And what did we say the the um? Yeah, what? Do, which was the specific benefit for this one? Uh, the benefit was that by uh by being discovered and taken in uh in by these people, you could get um information on how you might be able to come out from under your pact since you are hostile to your deity or your patron i mean right let's see here there's gonna be a better uh beyond your patron's senses if you agree this is one that we had a little... This one was before everything else was solidified. If you agree to assist, or I should say, whenever you agree to assist such a group, group is sufficiently uh, neutral for the moment. Mm-hmm. You gain inspiration for the you gain the what do I say? Inspiration for the Okay, so here what I want to do here, this is a design question. I want to say you gained in a point of inspiration and you can use that for the packed burner. 
So you gain a point of inspiration towards the Pact Burner uh, destiny. Is that does that work? You gain a point of it, yeah. So you gain a point of inspiration towards the. I don't know. Actually, let's just make it universal. You gain a point of inspiration because I think the points of inspiration you gain a universal inspiration. Or I just say you gain a point of inspiration. I'll do a language pass on this later. Get a point of inspiration. If you're gonna lose a point of inspiration by being discovered, and then just gain a point of inspiration back, maybe the losing of point of inspiration isn't necessary in the first place. Maybe well, is because may, may, maybe you should lose the point of inspiration if you refuse to help them. Ooh, I so I do like that, but like I said, the 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 narrative framework for this is that your patron is taking it away, and the advantage is we're about to give them a point of inspiration, which you can use. For any inspiration feature you have, yeah, you have. I was because you could sense my trepidation. I was considering it. Any, uh, any inspiration feature you have, or the packed burner yeah. inspiration feature. Yeah. Okay. The idea of losing a held in so you're going to lose a held inspiration because that that inspiration there might aid you in some necessary capacity mm. uh, while you're at this stronghold. You might have need like that that stronghold might get attacked, right? Mm -hmm. And stuff like that. So that's the idea. Is like you are temporarily a little bit lower on the totem pole. You're temporarily a little bit diminished. But if you make it through this situation you gain that inspiration feature. And this makes it so you can do this over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right? You could do this several times. And it's useful, even if you do end up getting the uh, the pack burner, mm -hmm. you're able to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's been my biggest concern when it comes to the unwitting, when it comes to the hostile to your patron path, is once you get the pack burner, if things go south for you, and if you do eventually get that pack burner, uh, Destiny... As opposed to the one that you wanted. Uh, like, what happened, like... Is that going to make these other ones useless? But no, once you get the pack burner Destiny, you can keep working against your patron. There's nothing stopping you. Yep. And this just this just boosts that additionally. Alright, okay. and then we have Parasite's Redoubt. Man, we really went all in on the Parasite. We really love that one. Yeah, the idea of siphoning away from a greater being and uh, and they're not aware of it is a. Uh, did I did I not say earlier that warlock has its has its term has its root um, terms in the concept of breaking oaths? Yes, you did. <laughs> now, yes, you did. If you want to go hardcore with it, it the the typical the the original meaning is breaking one's oath with god and inst and inst and writing their book out of the book of life and instead putting it in the devil's um black book of of death um but or in this case the monk's book of grudges <laughs> anything but that uh, i have volumes at this point i i'm i'm consigned to my fate of continuing to uh to bane him yeah <laughs> All right, so then we have the seventh level feature, which is as of yet unnamed, and we have the following options. First is Fanatic's Foothold, is what I renamed it to. Because mm -hmm. I think initially it was something like Patron Stronghold. Because <laughs> I couldn't think of anything better at the time. Yeah. You're able to establish a stronghold in your patron's name. It houses an enclave of followers who travel to the location on your patron's order. You retain the stronghold's benefits only so long as the inhabitants believe you to be a loyal follower of the patron. If they ever suspect otherwise, they will keep you out, imprison you, or even attempt to kill you. The only way to recover the stronghold's benefits is to reconcile with the inhabitants or clear them out. And reconcile could be something like, I killed the patron. <laughs> yeah, I'm the new patron now. Me. Uh, it's because I like I like including a little bit because these our initial complaint was about the lack of social components here, and all of these are still social. 
in some they're, capacity. I they're very social. Let's see here. The second one is this is I'm going to put this as unnamed hostile feature. Because oh, the, I one, the one where you work against them in secret. Right. This is where you're granted knowledge of a stronghold inhabited by the enemies of your patron. If you travel to this stronghold, you're able to undermine your patron without their knowledge. If you do so, what's up? Why not? Uh, why not just um, otherworldly saboteur? Oh, I like that. The otherworldly saboteur that implies the stealth, that implies the the sabotage, and that implies, you know, what, who and what you're doing it to. Absolutely. Plus, the word saboteur is always a really nice one that never ever gets used. I swear to God. It, it, it just rolls off the tongue in the most pleasant fashion imaginable. Except when you're referring to it in uh, Final Fantasy Thirteen. <laughs> I wasn't even going to go with that. I was going to go. I was going to go with the saboteur as as in the game. <laughs> Let's see here. If you do so, you're granted an inspiration feature of your choice. Uh, and if your patron discovers your treachery. They withhold your character's inspiration. Or sorry, they re they withhold your character's um, destiny until you reconcile with your patron or accept the pack burner destiny. Yes. Let's see here. When you reach, a and the final one is Eldritch Exhumation. Yes. I'm particularly proud of that name. It was, it was so good. It's so good. When you reach a major settlement... You learn the location of minor artifacts or records revealing of the inner workings of your patron's power. These yeah. artifacts or records are either held by somebody who values them above their own life or within a dangerous ruin that nobody else dare enter. If you spend time, in parentheses, studying these artifacts or records, you either gain a point of inspiration, immediate knowledge, and I'm going to, I'll have a little asterisk next to that thing that says you could use it on anything. Immediate knowledge of how to fulfill your character's destiny or the benefits of the patron's token. Yep. Yep. And and of course, being that, like, you're, you're going around at this point, like, collecting little bits of your patron's power. Yep, because that's how you're going to siphon it all away and make yourself the power now. <laughs> 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 all right. And then the final, the ninth level feature is called Eye to Eye. First, we have the unnamed friendly to my patron power. Actually, uh, I'm just going to call this good and faithful servant. What do, we, what do we call the good and faithful servant of a god? I think... <laughs> I... Oh, I need, a, I, need a, I need a different word. We call him uh, well done? Vicar of the Immaterium. Now, that's not Vigor, that's... Vicar, V-I-C-A-R. Ooh. <laughs> if you're a good and faithful servant, you're a priest or a, or a bishop or a vicar or a cardinal of some sort. Right, and given that we have the more exotic-sounding name... Uh, it has less of the positive connotations that we might otherwise interpret it with. Exactly. Alright, this is called... Let's see here. This is called... Yeah, Vicar of the Immaterium. Upon completing a long rest, you're given a point of inspiration by your patron. If you engage in any particularly offensive uh, activities to your patron that they were aware of, they can choose to revoke it that day. Patrons rarely do this multiple days in a row. Their attention is usually held elsewhere and are often too busy to hand out repeated punishments to anyone they don't feel like making a pack burner. Uh, then we have Regicide. <laughs> they say it in the Halo announcer's voice. You target a fellow warlock of the same patron. If you manage to kill, permanently incapacitate, permanently remove from your patron's senses, or persuade them to work against your patron, you gain one of the following benefits. An invocation of your choice with the Eldritch Tag. This does not count against your number of Eldritch Invocations. 
the benefits of the patron's token invocation twice. An inspiration feature of your choice. A benefit su suggested by the narrator involving fulfilling your destiny, a stronghold, a personal goal of yours, or knowledge of an artifact. And then finally, we have the Rite of Apotheosis. There is always a servant of your patron in the same region as you. You are always aware of their direction and rough distance away from you, though they are not necessarily aware of you. You can engage this servant in combat or negotiation. Symbios actually, I'm going to call it symb... Or nego yeah, I'm going to say negotiation. Uh -huh. To complete the Rite of Apotheosis, an arcane ritual allowing you to gain more power. If you kill the servant of your patron, or persuade them to join you... Actually, you know what? To join... Here's what I'm going to say. If you kill the servant in combat or persuade them to join your essence, you complete the rite of apotheosis. Each time you complete the rite, you gain a point of inspiration. Your patron can't force you to accept the pack burner destiny. So at ninth level here, it's like if the pack burner destiny. Just as a note for the folks at DM World, they, this again, we've been making a lot of references to it. This is something that your patron can basically force you to take if they find out that you've been a naughty boy. And this, the pack burner destiny, will allow you to retain some features of a warlock, but otherwise, it's going to force you into a different class. Whereas, if you reach level nine and take the parasite power. Yeah, you, you can't ever you can't ever not be a warlock. Right. They're unable to take the class from you. And more importantly, the, the pack burner also takes away one of the things it takes away is your otherworldly destiny. Which is yep. this uh, this destiny specifically affiliated with you being a warlock. Not necessarily specifically going to be fulfilled by your patron, but it's it's associated with you being a warlock. And if they force you to take the pack burner destiny you don't get access to the otherworldly destiny. That replaces whatever it was. Yep. And those are that's a list of really cool destinies that they real your players really aren't gonna want to give up. Yep. It's uh and it's with, with these three sets of three, nine mm, I love nine. Nine is my favorite number, so we've done well. Uh yeah. <clears throat> ending on the ninth level, in fact. Uh, -huh. uh <laughs> With these, with these class features that are extremely social in nature, but still have many mechanical hooks for things outside of the social aspect as well, uh, we have, in one fell swoop, corrected what irks us so greatly, what vexes us about this lazy port of a class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right this this was a lot of fun this got me over my anger <laughs> well now you don't have the spike to power forward your own shit i'll find something else to piss me off <laughs> this remember, is just true. remember it's better to be pissed off than to be pissed on but like i, I like can, i said i can early, only agree like i said earlier on um next week we'll be next week we'll have an opportunity to discuss the lawful stupid what? problem that is plagued next week's class for years ever <laughs> a, this has been a problem i always i always i always laugh whenever whenever somebody th somebody thinks that some of my critics that some of my criticisms are are an issue with a with whatever is the recent edition no some of these i've had some of these i've had these problems since day one <laughs> um Grant, granted, granted, where the where the day one begins and ends depends on when that when that particular class um, came to be, and obviously, with yeah. obviously with some of the early incarnations of some of these classes, there's still a we don't have we yeah. don't quite have an idea of what we're doing, like say the um, AD and D barbarian, mm -hmm. which was 
There was no point in taking it. <laughs> um, but that, but that's what we'll be covering for next week, and we'll and um, we'll pro once oh, once we're once we're completely caught up on the documents because I don't I don't foresee any more do any more um brands making new documents coming in, um, we w we will be. We will be probably do probably doing a bit of a capstone and then probably a reunion of sorts once the final book is in my hands. All right. Um. But and of course and of course there and of course there's always going there's always going to be fun stuff here in the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>